Peter and Allison, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you fine. Okay, great. Um, okay, so seeing a presence of a quorum, calling this meeting of the Amherst School Committee to order at 6.07 p.m. Welcome, everyone. Um, so just as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded uh, by Amherst Media and will be posted on the website later. I think we're still having some technical difficulties with uh, the live broadcast. Um, so uh, also just an important announcement, we currently have two members of our uh, committee that are joining us by phone. Um, we have Peter Demling, who is actually driving on his way here from a meeting um, just outside of Boston and should be here in about 45 minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and then we also have Allison uh, McDonald, who is currently uh, homesick, but wanted to join us for this conversation. Uh, so as per the rules um, for open meeting law, both of the members are allowed to participate in discussion, uh, and they can vote, but they don't count as part of a physical quorum, but we actually have a physical quorum here, so the committee can proceed with its business as usual. Um, so, uh, do I need to, to read this now? Okay. So there is actually something that's required to be read here. This is something that was passed, a policy and regulation that was passed uh, in January 23rd, 2017, and it's uh, with respect to our members not being present um, and participating uh, remotely. And basically, um, what I need to say is that the let the record reflect that the Amherst School Committee uh, member, Peter Demling, is attending remotely via speakerphone uh, today, uh, November 5th, 2018, for reasons of travel of work under 940 CMR 29.105. Mr. Demling, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, can all those who are presently here uh, hear Mr. Demling? Yes. Yes. Okay, so let the record reflect that Mr. Demling's attendance via speakerphone can be heard by all who are present at the meeting. And of course, all votes that are taken during the meeting uh, with the remote participants shall be by roll call vote. And I will, Ms. McDonald, uh, let the record reflect that Amherst School Committee member Ms. A uh, Ms. McDonald is attending remotely via speakerphone today, November 5th, 2018, uh, for reason of illness under 940 CMR 29.105. Ms. McDonald, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, can all those who are here hear Ms. McDonald? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let the record reflect that Ms. McDonald's attendance via speakerphone can be heard by all who are present at the meeting. Thank you all for your patience. Um, this is just a requirement, so we will proceed now as planned. <laughs> Uh, so the first order of business that we have is approving Amherst School Committee minutes of October 22nd. This, as a reminder, was a joint meeting. Uh, the first part of it was a joint meeting between the Select Board and the Amherst School Committee. And then we took a break and went on to, uh, to come back here, actually, so the meeting could continue. So I'll give the members a moment to look this over. Mr. Nakajima. I move the approval of the minutes of October 22nd, 2018. Okay. Do I have a second? A second. Okay, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any comments, edits to the minutes? Okay, seeing no comments. Okay. okay. Um, all those in favor? Signify by a roll call vote, please. Yeah, oh, okay. Mr. I just wanted to make sure. Nothing. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by a roll call vote, please. Nakajima, aye. Spitzer, aye. Ordonez, aye. Mr. Dumling? Dumling, aye. Ms. McDonald? McDonald, aye. Thank you. The meeting minutes are approved for October 22nd. Yeah, for relief. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, now moving on to announcements. Um, I have a couple of announcements, uh, but I will also look to the committee members to see if there's anything for um, the superintendent. Any comments or announcements? Okay. Mr. Demling, Ms. McDonald, do you have any announcements you'd like to make? Uh, no. I have none. Okay. 
So um, uh, just a very quick thank you to uh, uh, Joe Coverford and to Mindy Dom for coming out to Northampton uh, rally. Uh, actually more of a press conference given the rain. Um, so we had met uh, Mr. Dumling, myself, and um, Northampton School Committee members um, and several representatives from the state and local uh, area actually got together to um, basically let the, the community know that we were concerned with the proposed expansion of the Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School. And uh, we had members of the press come. Um, there were a couple of stories that came uh, as a result of that. And I think for the most part, it was a very positive uh, event. Uh, people actually felt really good to be there because it, the message was really um, just about the support for our public schools and how much we care about our public schools. But also a very important message coming from representatives from school committees in Holyoke and Springfield, uh, Northampton, here in Amherst, about the impact of charter schools um, and how this expansion would actually impact our budget in the upcoming year and why we're actually asking the state commissioner to reject the request for expansion. So there have been various letters that have been written by school committee mm -hmm. members and school committees uh, as well as select boards and uh, late uh, state and local representatives uh, asking the commissioner to not approve this most recent expansion. We've talked about it here during the committee. So I just wanted to again thank uh, these rep uh, representatives and others um, who attended in that very rainy Saturday and took time off from their schedule to do that. Um, okay, so with that, uh, I'm gonna open it up to public comment. If anyone has any public comment, please feel free to come up to the microphone, um, state your name, and you have three minutes to speak. Okay, seeing no public comments. Um, we'll move on to the superintendent's update. Sure. I'll be brief. Well, there weren't many public comments. There'll be a lot of comments in, in quite a while by many people who are here. So um, some of them are written and some I'm going to do orally as well. So tomorrow is a professional development day because it's election day and we made the decision last year, you made the decision last year to accept the recommendation of the APEA and myself to schedule um, not have students attend school on election day given the safety concerns. Um, you can see in the second basically all the pages except the first one uh, describe the activities in the morning. Um, they're focused on social justice and um, anti-racist, anti-bias work. And uh, the way we framed it was that um, all staff members have access, so paraeducators, um, professional staff, custodial staff, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, we, this really came, you think about March, I know we shared the professional development day that occurred last year in March and the feedback from that drove us to make the decisions we made. I think it's also notable that we've had more staff members um, commit to leading a session this year than we had last year, which is what we wanted. We definitely have some outside folks, but we also have a significant number of current staff members who stepped up to talk about what they're doing and the successes they're having as it relates to the general theme. Uh, our keynote, if you call it a keynote, it's a little different than a traditional one, will be students on a panel talking about their experiences and the student leadership around social justice. Mm. Um, so I'll do an introduction, they'll do uh, a panel, and then we'll go off into the session. So we're really excited about tomorrow. Um, and I really want to thank Tim Sheehan, who's in the audience, and Doreen Cunningham, who's not, because they're certainly the primary people responsible for the day tomorrow. Um, so we're very much looking forward to it. Um, I'll mention that the Alana Cabinet, this is a topic conversation that we talked about in my goals a couple of years ago, but I want to keep active because the group has continued to be active and, and what we've, the group has decided is this year's focus is right, increasing participation. So we have the Cabinet, but how do the pipelines between a lot of staff members at the schools more readily um, find its way to Ms. Cunningham and myself. So we're looking at some school-based meetings that then feeds into our conversations and we're supporting the a lot of cabinet members to facilitate that. They've happened, started happening at some of the schools and by the end of the year will happen in all schools and um, just making sure everyone feels like they have that pathway to um, higher or central office administration uh, and also to engender more community within mm -hmm. the Alana staff across the district. So um, I think it's, it's the right move. Um, I think getting conversations in smaller groups at a building level makes a lot of sense, and that's the way we're deciding to proceed this year. Um, Dr. Morris, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can I just interrupt Please. you for one second? I just want to make sure that um, the members on the phone can oh, hear you. I should be speaking louder, yes. Um, Mr. Denley, Ms. Uh, McDonald. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, a little louder would be, would be helpful. Okay. 
Thank you. I will do that. Yes, I agree. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so that's on the Alana cabinet. Uh, the next one, I had one of the more powerful and poignant experiences I've had actually in quite some time, separate from my role just as a human being, was uh, we had high school students, and I know this is an elementary meeting, but I do feel like it's worth mentioning here since they touched on their elementary experiences. So um, high school students decided to organize a meeting um, to talk about the Pittsburgh tragedy, talk about their, how they experienced um, the tragedy, but also how they experienced um, being a religious minority within this community. Um, and there were many notable things that happened. One is that it was sent out to everyone and allies were invited and there was a sig significant number of students who openly identified as not being Jewish but wanting to support that community, which I think spoke, speaks a lot about our larger community. Um, the students asked me if I'd reach out for a religious re leader and I want to thank publicly, I thanked him um, in other ways. Um, Rabbi uh, Weiner from the Jewish community of Amherst came and was really helpful in framing and contextualizing uh, the incident, the response, and the networks of support that exist. Um, and so we were really fortunate that he was able to, I mean, the, the run on his time for obvious reasons is significant, and he dropped what he was doing on a Friday afternoon uh, right before Shabbat and chose to spend an hour and a half mostly listening to students talk about their experiences. Was, was inc we're, we're incredibly grateful for his time and many of them talked about their experiences all the way back to elementary school which I thought was interesting because the students facilitated the meeting. Um, you know there was a couple staff members who also choose to, chose to attend but I would guess I didn't have a count but 90 percent of the comments were from students. I spoke once, the rabbi spoke once, uh, once that other staff member spoke once, but really the whole meeting was was not just spoken, but run and facilitated by the students, and it was powerful. More more on that perhaps at the region, but I think because it touched on their elementary experience, and I think it was we don't meet for region for a little while. I thought it was worth mentioning. Um, last week we taped uh, the next ver uh, episode of Window into ARPS, and it featured the science coordinator Jennifer Reese and Farmer Leila Leela, excuse me, Farmer Leela who work with students in the elementary gardens. Um, it'll be a really good episode. Um, you know, it's high interest for families and students, and also they were able to describe the origins and where they think the program can go, uh, which I think it will be great for the larger um, community to see, especially those, not only those with kids in school, but for the larger community to see what we're doing. Um, and the next episode, actually, one, uh, I got a response after the episode with Mr. Yaffe and Ms. Estes uh, from a parent guardian in, in the schools, elementary schools, who said, these are great, but I really want you to, you know, someone should feature the ELL, the English Language Learner Department, because they've done an amazing job with, and really made a huge impact on my child. So we're going to do that. So it's great to be able to respond to feedback that way. Uh, three other ones that didn't make it on here. One, from an MASC perspective, um, I was able to attend with Mr. Demling. I think it was the Region 5 MASC meeting. There were three presentations, one from the Berkshire Task Force looking at regionalization, one from Springfield that looked at a presentation about the tale of four cities focused on Springfield, Holyoke, Worcester, and I believe it was Brockton. Hmm. Um, and then talking about Amherst Pelham and the Amherst Pelham Regional Schools uh, about the impact of, um, we were all talking about finance in, yeah. in different ways. And uh, in addition to enjoying the company, it was great to see the other presentations. It definitely helps inform um, our work to hear what other districts and regions, in the case of the Berkshires, are struggling with and dealing with. Uh, last night, I was able to attend the uh, Roger L. Wallace Award Ceremony. So Lauren Matone, who's a teacher at Crocker Farm, was this year's awardee and was highly attended and festive atmosphere and environment for everybody. And uh, it was great to be able to, I started the same day Lauren did in the same school, both teachers at Fort River. So we, we had some nice moments just reminiscing of, you know, where we are and where we are. And um, that, that was a lot of great event. And thank you to the foundation who puts on not just that event, but uh, to, to my comments last night, I started by saying the first 12 years in the district, there was a Robert Frost award given to the high school staff and nothing for anybody below high school. And it didn't feel great to, not just me, but a lot of elementary staff. And in addition for honoring Roger Wallace, who was a mentor of mine, I started teaching in sixth grade. It was, it's really notable that we recognize that we have a pre-K to 12 continuum of educators who all make a huge difference. And the other thing I said was imitation, was it imitation the finest form of flattery, whatever. So the middle school PGO has now t taken up the mantle a couple years ago, and now we have an award for elementary, middle, and, and high school oh, staff. So um, it's nice to be copied. Um, 
And lastly, just a quick facilities update. We met two weeks ago. Um, just a quick update is that, you know, um, Mr. McPherson, he's retiring this week, but he his last work has been to um, exhaustively look through every all the element, I mean, the secondary, but I'll speak to this one, the elementary schools, uh, to build a capital plan that looks out not just for next year, but multiple years into the future, understanding what the current challenges are, uh, what can be addressed short term, what can be addressed sort of medium term, and the long term is a different conversation we'll talk about a little later tonight. And so it's a little atypical uh, for Amherst, where um, as opposed to the region, because in Amherst the capital budget goes to JCPC, and at region it's much cleaner because the school committee votes on it. But what, uh, what I'd like to do is at the next meeting bring a draft of that capital plan, because it's such a high interest um, it, it is of such high interest at the elementary level and have a little bit of an atypical process wise a little bit of an atypical conversation but I think we'll be ready to go a couple of weeks from now with the draft and I do think it'd be good for you and the community to understand the thought process we're having and the dollars attached frankly um, to start taking uh, the deferred maintenance taking a swipe at the deferred maintenance and really making some some true headway on uh, what are our urgent needs, in our opinion, of the facilities at the elementary level. So uh, when we get to the future planning, we can talk more about it, but um, I think m much of our work has been making sure the buildings are clean. We spent the Saturdays, I think I described that, but we're now in the phase of really thinking through what the larger next steps will be, because um, we know we're not going to have a new building or renovated building anytime in the next couple years, and we have to make sure these buildings can work for the staff, the faculty, and the students uh, for some time. And um, trying to prioritize the needs has not been an easy process, but it's been um, really has truly been a full sweep of every building, every classroom, every exterior space. And so we'll bring that back next week or next time, excuse me, which I think is November 27th. That's right. Yeah, we should, we'll be ready to, to present that here next time. Thank you, Dr. Morris. That actually Thank makes you. me very happy to hear. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Any comments or questions for the superintendent for this update? And how about for Ms. Uh, Go ahead, Mr. Dumbling. Yeah, um, uh, Dr. Morris, I'm glad you mentioned the um, presentation by the superintendent from Springfield, um, the, the, the four towns. And I just wanted to make a general comment that you know, this is going to be a huge fiscal year of advocacy for state funding of public education. And um, it was really one of the most heartbreaking things I had heard on my, my time on the committee of hearing the details of what has been cut in Springfield Public Schools. And so when we talk about advocacy for, for state funding of public education, of course it affects us and it affects, you know, our children in our town. But you know, we have colleagues, we have brothers and sisters in other towns that are getting destroyed by the underfunding of public education. And it's, it's, it's an economic and moral issue that I think our representatives speak really well on. And, um, you know, I just wanted to highlight that as a, a, a theme going forward for this year of advocacy. Thank you, Mr. Dumling. There's a lot of nodding heads here. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. McDonald, is there anything that you wanted to add or say to or ask the superintendent? Nope. I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Sure. Okay, so uh, moving us along um, to new and continuing business, the first item on the agenda is the Specialized uh, Special Education Program Working Group recommendation. So Dr. Morris, are you going yes, to? Yes, I'll introduce, and then we have a lot of members of that group, and I, I don't know if everyone's speaking, but uh, <laughs> I see nodding or shaking heads, so not everyone, but I think we'll have some representatives who are, are gonna come up and we can, we can figure out maybe a space toward the front where there's a microphone. So uh, I think, um, three things I want to share and, and, and then really pass it on to the group that did the work. So I was able to be, um, I would say, in and out of the group. Uh, I wasn't a group member, but I would come and offer some contextual feedback every now and then so that the group was well informed with other things going on in the district that we weren't siloed. Um, and um, my observations were that the group was incredibly hardworking. Uh, I think there's a lot of Google Docs and you know lots of the evidence you'll see of a, of a summary of a tremendous amount of work that occurred. Um, they were flexible in their thinking. Um, so uh, what I was impressed with was they didn't. I didn't perceive that group members came in with a preconceived notion of an outcome. Uh, and I think you'll see some evidence of just the exhaustive nature of all the different options that they looked at. 
And I think they also did a fantastic job listening to one another. So you have a group format, you have really intelligent, uh, passionate people who are choosing their life's work, or in the case of parents, really connected to this work, uh, talk about a pretty major issue where kids go to school. And yet I saw a flexibility of thought and an openness to listen that I think is a good model for any topic that we do at any point in time. Um, and I think to that point, you know, the group, my experience with the group when I would go in and out is there was different times where there was strong leanings one way or the other. Um, and not like just at the beginning. I mean, when the work had already, most of the bulk had been done. And I really appreciate the advocacy. I'm going to look away for a second because they're, they're here and it feels weird to talk about them. And, um, not look at them. You know, I appreciate the advocacy that occurred and at the appropriate moments and really the continued thinking. So we would take straw poles or I'd see straw poles and then people would sleep on it and say, hey, I thought more about this. What about? And, and it really was an iterative process. Um, so I just want to publicly thank people who dedicated some time in the summer and they thought they were done and then they got together in the fall and they thought they were done and they got together. This is still fall-ish. just doesn't feel like it so much um, for their work. Um, and I feel very comfortable to preview where they'll get to at the end. I feel very comfortable with both the process that was used and also the outcome in terms of their recommendation. Um, but I think with that, I'll pass it over to the group. Great. And, and just before you do, yeah. Dr. Morris, I'm wondering if you could just give a 30-second reminder sure. um, of oh, the genesis you. of this. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. So uh, this group uh, last year, there was an enrollment working group subgroup that looked at this very question. Um, about specialized, specialized special education programs and what was the best location uh, to meet all students' needs, and that was the framing. Uh, the group did a lot of work last year and then kind of offered some advice for future groups to do work, and one of the pieces of advice was that people who are in the work should be the ones really digging in, that there was some feeling of the group last year did a great job, but that there were experts in this area, and we're fortunate to have them here tonight, uh, who should take the data that was developed last year uh, and do a deeper dive, and that's what we did. Um, and I'm really pleased, thank you for that reminder, because I think it's important to make that uh, explicit connection to work that we did last year. Thank you. And I think, I know Jen McIntyre is um, one of the people, but maybe, um, I don't, and I thought there was one other, Catherine Lodge. Yeah, as a, I'm gonna talk, and yeah. these guys are gonna come up and sit in the front. Okay, very good. Pardon so me. for the presenters, if you don't mind, uh, just you can stand near the mic over there. Okay. And, um, or I guess it, there's a lot of you over here. Um, so maybe just in the front row here. Um, yeah. But let's bring the mic closer just to make sure that the folks that are on the phone can also hear you. And we have an extra mic here, I think, for. Yeah. I think you yeah, you could borrow that. Yeah, mic why don't you over take there. this mic here? So we each have a mic. We have this one here. We didn't practice with a mic. <laughs> What's easiest? What's, whatever you What's easiest for you? Yeah. Yep. Whatever's easiest for you. It's all easy for us. Um, so thank you for letting us talk today. Um, we had a big group of people, and we'll talk about that in our presentation, who actually did all of this work. I'm not sure what you said. Um, so first, though, I wanted to start with the charge of our group. What um, Dr. Morris asked us to come together and do is really to work together to explore the possibility of creating an additional building blocks program in another program and uh, in another, excuse me, in another elementary school. Currently we have two programs in the Fort River School. We have our building blocks program and we have our AIMS program and we have about uh, room for about 30 kids in those programs. And so we were trying to figure out if we maybe split those programs up and disperse them across the elementary schools if that would make more sense. Um, we did this because of um, sort of in the broader context of where it made the most sense to educate all of our students that had highly specialized um, educational needs. Um, and also as a result of the special ed working group that Dr. Morris was just talking about. And we also wanted to address the fact that there's a higher percent of students with disabilities within Fort River because of the higher number of programs that are in that classroom and how that uh, impacts the school overall. Um, we came together knowing that this was our charge, but that we would have other issues that came up, including you know things that we would need to really identify, talk about, and sort of put on the table to continue talking about it at a later date. Um, we had a number of uh, diverse group. We had special ed administrators, both Dr. Brady and Joanne Smith were there, as well as Diane Chamberlain joined us. 
Um, I was there. I'm the elementary program coordinator um, at the special. Uh, excuse me, at the elementary level. Um, our school psychologist for the building blocks program, Jessica Rudnick, who's here in the front, was there, um, as was one of the building block teachers, Kristen Rhodes. We had another special education teacher who was a Fort River specific teacher, uh, Karen DiMatteo. We had a general ed teacher, one of the um, Fort River librarian, Lenny Blackman. We were lucky enough to have a paraeducator in our group, which I think really was something special because we don't often have that, um, that representation. And we had two parents, uh, Catherine Lodge and Nancy Stewart, uh, both also CPAC representatives. We met exhaustively. <laughs> Some of these meetings were three and um, I think four hours long um, in the summer. And then again, um, like Dr. Morris said, we came together in mid-August and then at the beginning of September. And then again, uh, just last week to finalize our thoughts and our recommendations. We thought a lot. I included these slides. We took a lot of pictures of the work that we did, but I just wanted to represent what um, Dr. Morris was talking about, that we, we thought a lot and we wrote things down and we really um, tried to capture, I tried to capture that, that we were thinking about all of the programs, where all of the students were coming to our programs from, like if you are um, living in a Wildwood district and you need to go to building blocks and you have to change your, your home school to come over to building blocks. We talked about that. We talked about um, all the different lenses that we needed to represent at this meeting, that the parents would have some ideas, that teachers and general ed teachers and special ed teachers might have different thoughts and ideas. And then we got down to the nitty gritty of what did it mean to have a program in one school versus two schools and what that would impact, how that would impact everybody. We spent a long time on this. We had many, many documentations, like saying, what are the pros? What are the cons? You know, what are the things that work to have them in one school, and what are the things that might be better to have them in multiple schools? And we also had sort of our you know, parking lot of other topics. What were some of the other things that we needed to consider if we were really going to think through the needs of our specialized programs and the students in the schools as well? Um, we identified 13 options. We might have been able to identify more, but that was a lot. And we talked through all of those different options, and we thought about, you know, just some of the obvious things, like moving building blocks and splitting that into two different schools, but also some of the less obvious, like what if we impacted Crocker Farm? What if we moved the intensive learning students into the Fort River School and moved the building block students into the Wildwood School? And so we tried to just be really open to all the different scenarios that we could come up with. Um, once we identified those options and went through them, we sort of came up with a list of um, considerations. And I'm going to let Catherine talk about those. Hi, I'm Catherine Lodge. Um, my daughter is in the PIP program at the high school. She has been um, in the preschool, Wildswood, um, the middle school, and now a senior at the high school. Um, just so I'm perfectly clear, the lens that I looked at this through was like, what is good for the kids? I didn't think about money. Um, I was just thinking about what's the best for parents and kids. Um, so our underlying beliefs were inclusion and students receiving appropriate level of supports. Um, things that I really was concerned about and thought about were um, most of the models didn't allow for uh, children to attend their neighborhood schools, which was initially a concern for me. Um, the uneven numbers of students with uh, special education concerns. Um, special considerations were transportation and um, children being able to go to school with their siblings. Um, and our recommendation came that we retain the special ed specialized programs in their current locations. Um, Fort River having two building blocks classrooms and one Ames program. Wildswood with their two um, ILC classrooms and Crocker Farm maintaining their preschool. So it seems like a lot of work to come up with a recommendation to stay the same, right? That's, but that's what we did. <laughs> um, and probably one of the number one reasons for this was some of the work that we also did in the building blocks, um, some building block summer development as well. 
um, we change the needs of our programming based on the population of students that are in it at any given time. And so we met this summer to talk about the, the student population that we had and um, changed the model of service delivery slightly this year. And what we did was really lends itself to having two classrooms in one building. So we have this model right now with the two classrooms in one building and it really allows for a continuum of service delivery within that one school. We have two teachers and two rooms and that allows us to take some of our students have, who have more significant social emotional needs and are receiving the majority of their education within that classroom to be in the classroom with one teacher but then allows us to have a second teacher who is available for the students that are, are following more of a in inclusion profile, who are getting more of their education in the general education environment. When we split into two schools, we lose that opportunity because the kids that are then the ones that have the social emotional needs require the teacher to be with them most of the day. The students who are more able to be included throughout the day don't have the opportunity to have a teacher there to go in to model for the pair educators, to consult with the general ed teachers, to talk to the librarian, to talk to the PE teacher. So that continuum of service delivery would be lost if we split up. Um, on, uh, on the same, in the same um, area is in the inclusion supports. Because we have that, we have the two teachers in one building, one of our teachers is freed up to move around the building and make sure that we are, um, we are uh, observing students in the inclusion classroom, we are there for the general educators, and we can really focus on the inclusion, which is, a, I think, something that Amherst really prides itself on. I know that it's one of the reasons I like to work in Amherst. I've been here 12 years, and it's one of the reasons I, I really like what we're doing here with our intensive special needs kids. <clears throat> also, the third piece of this is equity of treatment for all of our students, and this goes back to the same um, piece if we move into two classrooms and we have one teacher having to work most of the time with our most needy kids, we're going to, the kids that don't have as significant needs are going to be educated more by paraeducators. It's just what's going to happen. Because the teacher won't be able to move into the classroom, they won't have the same level of support from that special education teacher. So we developed this program where we split the, the population of students more this year based on the students that are there. And we have had a really successful year. We have kids that are um, included most of the uh, day. And we have kids that have some <laughs> significant needs. I really need to get that one. Um, that have some significant needs that uh, have made great progress. And we're really proud of them. But I think a big part of that is because of the way we've changed our model. Um, So the last piece of that is that I think uh, Dr. Morris went back and looked at our special ed percentages. And we have um, a number of students in the sixth grade in our building blocks program right now. Uh, I think we have 10 students in the sixth grade. And so with those students graduating from our program and with some of the other um, ed the students graduating in the sixth grade at the building blocks, our percentages will change dramatically next year. So instead of being and I think I'm reading this right, 8.6% higher, we're going to drop down to only 4.3% higher, which is not, it's, it's, it's much more um, similar than 4% versus close to 10%. So because of those reasons, we opted to remain the same. We have more stuff to look at. We still haven't figured out transportation. This is a problem to get kids from one school into another school is, is hard work, and our transportation department is, is amazing. Um, the problem of siblings, we really haven't uh, gone into. So if you have a student, if you have two kids and one goes to Wildwood and one goes to Building Blocks, and you want them to both be at the same school, we don't have a solution for that yet, but we hope to talk more about it. And also just the changing needs of those special ed percentages by school over time. I mean, I think that uh, Faye talks about this a lot, that as the population of the students in your programs change, then we really need to be able to um, respond to that. And we may see that this changes over time and we may need to come back together and we may need to, to do something different. But at this time, it seems to be working and we'd like to move forward. The recommendation is to move forward uh, and stay the same. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just need to make a quick announcement so some folks may have heard that, that we lost uh, Mr. Demling on the phone, but he had actually warned me that this would probably happen once he hit a certain patch of, of the, the roadway. Mm -hmm. So he had asked me to call him back in about 10 minutes or so, and he okay. suspected that he would be 
back online. So. So, Dr. Morris, do you yeah. want to add anything to that? Or? Yeah, I want to thank uh, Catherine and, and Jen for presenting um, and articulating and drilling down many, 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 many of hours of work into, you know, a pretty finite number of slides and, and minutes for a presentation. So, um, I think um, I think the only thing I'd like to add, just come back to where I was at the beginning, is given the process, given the level of detail and work, that occurred by the group, I feel very comfortable with the recommendation um, that was made. And the last point's an important one, that it's not a forever decision or recommendation. It's that we have to continue to look at our program of services, who our students are, and whether the model's working. And what I heard from the group, um, particularly this fall, after the changes that occurred in the summer, not many changes in students, but changes in um, staffing uh, how the staff was being utilized um, to support students is that the program the model is working right now and it's working to meet students' needs and to the cost benefit analysis that they use, I'm fully um, agree with and endorse. Any comments, uh, questions from the committee? Mr. Nakajima? Or Ms. Spitzer? Um, you go first. <laughs> thank you very much for the presentation and for all the hard work. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, the amount of time you guys put into this. I just have a couple questions. Um, first off, I was just wondering for the benefit of the, the folks at home, if you could just quickly outline building blocks, aims, and ILC. Like, what, what does ILC and aims stand for? Um, yeah. Not just for us, but for, we for have, everybody um, watching. Can you, is this close enough? So we have three district programs in Amherst. The um, Building Blocks program is the program for our students that have social-emotional needs and need um, more social-emotional supports. They often have some type of trauma history in their background that sort of binds them together. We have um, two classrooms for our ILC, which is our intensive learning um, center. The students in that classroom tend to have more um, educational needs where they need to have their um, learning broken apart into really small components and put that back together. Um, that sort of is what brings them together is some cognitive differences and, and um, disabilities. And the final program, our AIMS program, is for our students who used to be considered to have Asperger's or high functioning autism that have more social pragmatic needs and really need to work on forming friendships and understanding social rules and social norms. And those are the three programs that we have. Yeah, and thank you for that, because it really makes sense that you'd want to have clusters, I think, around the professionals who specialize in these specific um, areas of special education. So my, my, I guess I have two questions. Um, one was just if you could outline any outreach to families who were not members of the groups, because I, I have heard in my personal experience the at least there's a perception in the community that the, there is a big um, burden placed on families with students who are attending their not not attending their neighborhood schools. And mm -hmm. that's the thing I hear the most when, um, uh, both when I was just out there campaigning and then also, you know, as a school committee member, I hear that all the time. So I was wondering what would be, and if this was explored at all, I can see the perfectly the, the reason why we'd want to keep this as the status quo, but is there any potential to move the child who's the sibling of the non-special ed child into the school that the child needs to, you know, attend for this specialized program. Was that, maybe that's something that's going to be just discussed at a later time once you've made the decision whether or not to move forward with this current model, but it seems like we could look at it also, that might be one potential solution that wouldn't disrupt the, the learning that goes on in these specialized classrooms. So it, it did come up as a topic and we did spend some time talking about it. There isn't a simple answer to that because mm -hmm. there's um, no one right or wrong way to do it and different parents have different um, things that they want to do. Um, so we discussed talking about it more after we made a decision of where the programs were going to land and how is the best um, way to handle that, to have either to see if we could figure out how to accommodate the parents and have both kids in one school or, again, not all parents are going to choose that, so make that a choice. Um, with that said, one thing I didn't point out too, which is a future topic, is to think about what to do with students that graduate our program. Because if you have a student that's attended a specialized program for three or four years and has done it, we've done some amazing work with them and now they're ready to go back into the general ed um, population, if we take them from Fort River where all their supports are and put them back into their home school, then that's really um, taking a kid that's somewhat vulnerable and putting them into a situation that's somewhat untenable. So at this point, we've been making a case-by-case -case, um, decision on that, but we've talked about getting back together to do more work around that as well to try and figure out the best way to um, look at those, those two particular topics. 
we don't have a great answer yet. It's good that you're Next talking summer. about it. Yeah, no, thank you. Mr. Nakajima? So I'm, I'm impressed with the um, the level of work and effort that the team put into this. Um, I guess one thing, a couple things I'm wondering is, is given that you just did a bunch of work, is is there a plan to move on to the next step? Like the future topics, you know, mm -hmm. right away? Or is it, or, or it going to sit for a while? I don't know if you... Uh, I mean, I think both. Right, so some of it we have to address right away. We have kids that we're hoping to graduate out in the next couple of months. So the, the talk about what, what we're gonna do is gonna be right there because we have to make those decisions now so that we can start that transition process. Um, the siblings is probably a bigger issue that will be taken up at, at an administrative level to figure out, because it's gonna impact the uh, enrollment in each of the different elementary schools. Right, no, that makes sense. I mean, the, cha the, the funny challenge of ending up with the status quo is that some of the, a lot of the issues that have been raised and have been talked about is um, at least concerning some members of the, of the population of the community uh, remain right. So you, so you sort of you, yeah. it immediately makes you feel like uh, I mean you've done all this work so I'm if you said you wanted to take a break anyways I'd understand <laughs> why you would um, but it it sort of makes you want to jump into the next step and see what progress we made there. The other the, there's a funny question. There's maybe something you don't want to answer. I have no idea. But like, a funny question for me is, how much did you learn as a group? So when you started out, you said you had you tried to keep away from preconceptions, which means you started out with the concept that maybe there wouldn't be much harm in separating out, uh, doing different chunks of building Brock's programs throughout um, the elementary um, schools. The practical learning that you've gotten that you've described today, on the other hand, seems to be exceptionally well articulated about why you wouldn't want to do that, why it's not in the best interest, obviously for professional development for the staff, but frankly just for the population of, of kids, for the students, and how differentiated they are, you wouldn't be able to give them the appropriate attention and support that's tailored to their specific needs without setting up the way it is now. So I'm, just, I'm actually just curious for anyone in the group um, how much learning you did over the last few months that moves you to this really articulate and in depth. The reason, I'm, and the reason I'm asking the question, but also part of the reason I'm asking is, it tells me why it's worth diving into these next topics. That if your assumption is not that there's a one size fit all single shot answer, and that there may be differentiated answers, to me it reinforces the value of doing that work in this manner. So I just love to hear about what, how much of that journey you went on. I mean, I, do you want me to answer this question? Does anybody else want to speak up? No. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I think it was a journey. And I, I know that, um, you know, I've been with the programs for a long time. I started in the schools, and I've been working within the three programs for quite a while. And so I have some, I had some ideas about things I would like to see. And they changed over time um, based on the work that we did together. I think that um, the building blocks um, model and what we do as a team I think was not well understood by other members of the group that were outside of our team. I think that was really um, something that we we learned that um, but, but, but that we were able to articulate over time and that people I think came to a better understanding of um, what it was that we were doing and trying to do with that with that particular population of students. Um, I, I think that there was a lot of, of movement in different directions where we'd say, oh, wow, we're going to go this way. And then someone would come back to the group and say, well, have we considered this? And it would sort of sway things to more conversations. So, I mean, overall, I think it was very worthwhile to spend the time doing it. Um, and I know that, again, I, I changed my conceptions from what I wanted to do. I was really hardcore at the beginning. I'm like, we're going to just do this. This is what I want to do. And that's not what we ended up recommending at all. So, Thank you. Faye. Yeah, you want to add to that? Can I just add one thing? Um, I was at most of the meetings and did a lot of listening. And what I observed, to your point, um, was that people who had really strong opinions and strong feelings one way or the other, I watched that evolve and change and people switch totally and then back to where they were. I think it's not very often that educators get this amount of time to sit down and collaborate and listen and 
really think together. Um, mm. It's like a think tank. And people really changed where they were. Um, and it was just a beautiful thing to watch, that people were safe. People really articulated very, very different perspectives and just went from where they were um, to whole different places. And then even when, kind of, I, I forget the date, when we thought we had a decision, people, as Dr. Marr said, said, no, I thought I meant that when I voted, but I really want to say something else now. So I think it was a really genuine process. And the fact that we had, um, I think to your point, we, we only had two parents involved. We had Catherine and Nancy Stewart, who was there for part of them. But they really spoke as collectively as possible for as many families as they've talked to. So I don't think we had two parents just speaking from an individual perspective, but really trying to um, have more of a collective input. Um, and both expressed lots of different feelings that made the whole group stop and think and reconsider it. So it was fascinating to wind up right back to where we started, though. It was an interesting process. Thank you. Um, so I actually uh, have a question as well, but before I do that, I'm going to try to see if I can get Mr. Demling back on the phone again sure. because I know he. Show me to try to do that so you off. can. Would you? I'm happy to. Well, let me just because okay, I think it's sure. probably less disruptive that way. Okay. Let's see. So it's nine and one, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So one thing I would just say while while you're dialing is. Um, I, I, I appreciate the recommendations and the work, and I think the presentation itself was really interesting and informative. I'm also just, I'm saying this to Dr. Brady as well as also to the superintendent, I'm endorsing the method. <laughs> if we have subjects like this, and particularly where... Mr. Dumley? Hi. Hi. We lost you, we got you back. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. That was a... Okay. <laughs> but I'm saying particularly where we there's a there's a core program, whatever the services, whatever the educational program, it's a core essential program that's serving um, some of our students, either as part of the curriculum or otherwise. And there are concerns that are developing around how it should be modified, how it should be developed. What's the best way? to try to think about, I mean I think the enrollment working group process is really great too, but then to give the educators with a really a, a wide stakeholder group with the professionals and parents the opportunity to engage at this level of depth um, is really just uh, you know immeasurably valuable when you think about what you could otherwise end up with if you have like a flavor of the month or some so you go like I mean I'm not, I'm not trying to be sarcastic but you know you go to a workshop the workshops eye-opening you come back with an idea you start thinking about implementing the idea and you haven't taken the time to really do a deep, rich evaluation of what you have and what and what the different factors are. And it's not perfect, but nothing ever is, right? You're talking about the reality we live in. <clears throat> Anyways, I just think that was really. I know you finished dialing. I'm sorry. I just, <laughs> but I really wanted to say that because I think it's. I think it's. A, I think it's a good teachable moment for this for the school committee, for the staff, and for the leadership to think about. So I just want to give a chance to uh, Ms. McDonald and Mr. Demling uh, if you have any questions or comments uh, for the group. Um, yeah, so I, mean, I just wanted to share that, you know, I think I can see what a tough problem this is. Um, you know, when, when I first moved to Amherst, my oldest son went to the ILC program at Wildwood, uh, and yet we live in the Parker District. So from the get-go, my kids were split, and that was a definite loss. So it was, it was not ideal um, for that to be the case. Um, and, and yet I totally see the, um, and, and, and agree with the, the resource and teacher support um, argument that this group included with and that we was reiterated in the, the letter we read from the link block staff. Um, and just how you know, that there's there's a certain level of resource based constraints that restrict how flexible we, we could be here when we know that we have pretty significant resource constraints. Um, so yeah, I, I also want to thank the group for, for spending those multiple three to four hour meetings. Um, because this is this is a very difficult problem to solve in an ideal way and it's it's uh, probably something we'll continue to talk about as our um, as our 
and their facility development. Thank you, Mr. Demling. Ms. McDonald, is there anything you wanted to add or, or a question you had? Um, yeah, just real quick, I've still done, um, I think, what Mr. Demling and others have already said, but I, first, thank you for all of this extremely hard work and in-depth um, exploration that the team has done. Um, it, it's been educational, and I think also, you know, when we, when we were talking about the issues um, and <coughs> You know, one of the questions is, is, is definitely do we restructure the program? And I think you've answered that and, and recommend that your recommendation is, is a strong one to, to not change the structure of the program. What that does is it puts more um, urgency, I think, in, in um, addressing the, the future topics to explore that you've outlined on the last slide, um, in particular the question about the siblings' um, uh, school attendance as well as I think, as you mentioned in your presentation, what to do with the with the students who um, graduate, as you said, um, from the program, um, and it's less than ideal in many cases to send them back to their their home school. So, given that we've explored restructuring the program and decided that no, that's not what we want to do, given our resource constraints, um, but also in the best interest of the program, we really need to step up and look at how do we how do we address or uh, at least alleviate some of the other issues um, uh, that, that you've listed here. Um, so that, that, I, I think that's what everybody else is saying, so I just want to add my voice to that. Sure. Um, as a parent of a child with special needs, um, originally I thought, oh, everyone should get to go to their neighborhood school. We should have, you know, an Ames of Building Blocks and an ILC at all the schools. Um, that way parents and, you know, it's easier for parents to get their kids to school and um, kids can stay with their siblings. And now after really thinking about it, I feel that it's great when kids really have a peer group. So there's more kids in the ILC. There's more, you know, s kids with special needs. They have their group they can bond with and also gives parents a group kind of to bond with and learn from and, you know, figure out what the resources are for their kids. Um, so that's really what changed my decision and made me feel really good about keeping the programs the way they are. Uh, so while we're talking about these programs, it has felt compelled to thank the people that work directly with our students in these programs. Our paraeducators, our teachers, our psychologists, they have a level of expertise that is second to none and want to recognize the asset that they are to our school district and our students um, because they understand the needs of our kids to a level that is outstanding. And um, speaking to that cohort fact, it's not only a cohort for the kids and a community for the kids to find their safe place. Um, we now have seen a sixth grader in the Ames program become a mentor to a younger student. So having that age range ability for them to cross uh, cross pollinate to a, to a certain extent is a wonderful thing too and allows them a growth opportunity that they might not be awarded if there was a smaller number of kids. Um, as well, in the years that I've been at Fort River, I've been able to see the collegiality between the programs grow as well where um, that level of expertise and that level of resource is shared um, and also shared with the general population of our staff. But um, it has been a wonderful thing to watch grow and develop. And as the programs have grown and developed monumentally in the years that I've been there, it really has been to benefit of the kids. So I just wanted to recognize everybody publicly for their outstanding work. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Brady, did you want to say something? So I was going to say what Diane just said to really thank people, um, but I, I wanted to comment one other thing because um, are the participants on the phone were talking about the resource allocation and how maybe, you know, in the constraints we have, how we make decisions based upon that. I, I do want to reiterate, I think either Catherine or Jen said it before, none of this was done with that in mind. In fact, Dr. Morris was very explicit to say, don't put that on the table. So these decisions and this discussion was all based upon what is the student with the student's needs in mind. And in terms of special education, that's my interest, that that's how we make decisions. Sometimes then we, down the road, have to get into the real world and kind of think about that within another framework. But this was made without that in mind. In fact, I guess earlier on, a few meetings back, there was a 
proposal that wasn't what this one was that would have had more resources needed. Um, and Dr. Morris was very clear, we're, we're not making the decision based upon that. If that's what's going to be, come forward with that. So this was all based upon just student interest and student need, and I give them a lot of credit. That's not easy to do when you kind of know in the back of your mind people are wondering about resources. Thank you very much. Um, I just have actually one comment, I guess, and, and I think it was back to, I can't remember who it was that mentioned it now, but um, the, you know, I, I definitely want to thank uh, the CPAC parents for taking the time to, um, well, to spend thinking about this, right? But at the same time, also acknowledge that it's, it's you know, I think uh, a small number of parents that are being asked to represent a very wide community and diverse community, and so I think it'd be worthwhile <coughs> in next steps, um, you know, Mr. Nakajima had mentioned before, sort of what comes next. I think it'd be really important for us to actually make sure that we reach out to more members of the community because, uh, you know, I'm looking at transportation and siblings. Those are definitely two of the top issues that we keep hearing from members of our community who are particularly challenged because they're either taking public transportation or they have multiple children that are spread out throughout the, the district. And so um, it's a question that we have to be very cognizant of and have sort of at the front of our minds. Um, to me, this isn't settled. I think that we still have to come back and figure out how we address this problem. Um, and I would like to, um, you know, I was excited by the enrollment working group last year because I felt like this was a question that they, they immediately grappled with and they were asking it out loud. Um, I think we have lost Mr. Dumbling again. Um, <laughs> And I was hopeful that we would be able to come up with a solution of some kind. And while I appreciate the group's work on this and understand the reasons for, you know, kind of going back to status quo, whatever you want to call it, um, I do think that this is still a, an outstanding problem um, and that we haven't answered it yet. And so I'm hopeful that we can come back uh, sooner rather than later, maybe after you guys have had a break. <laughs> Um, and we can think a little bit more about this and, you know, and, and put together a plan that really addresses those problems. Yeah. But thank you. Um, Ms. Could I just add one thing, and it's related to that I was going to say even beforehand, was I think it would be really important if we could either find a way to communicate this to the larger public through either an op-ed, a letter to the parents, or, or just some sort of communication. It doesn't have to come from the committee, but even if somebody could explain that we have you have been spending months thinking about this mm -hmm. and people's minds were changed. Like I, I think a letter from a, a parent like yourself speaks much more loudly than something coming from the school committee because if, if if people really did do these you know 180s on where they stood and it only happened because they spent this time together in a room like it's going to be hard to ask the public to to come along for that ride without some sort of uh, communication so i'm happy to think about ways we could do that but um i think it would be really useful mr Duncan, yeah no i wanted to uh, jump on that thought because i liked it a lot um in in my mind, if the, the superintendent was able to include um, as an attachment into one of your newsletters um, some kind of summary or letter that went out to the community, obviously all the parents, but um, the professional staff too, I think that would be really useful. Um, and in particular, not just the PowerPoint, because when I saw the PowerPoint, I had lots of questions that you answered during your presentation. But when I sort of walked at the door, I was thinking to myself, hmm, I really need to understand this better. And then when you were done talking, I'm like, okay, now I understand it better. <laughs> so you would need to have a little a little bit of exposition around it, similar to what you, what you talked about tonight. Great, well, um, I think we're good then on this topic. Uh, thank you very much for, for taking the time to present for all of you for your hard work. We really appreciate it. Um, and with that, I just want to welcome Mr. Dumley, who is physically here now. <laughs> <laughs> Metaphysically, spiritually. Yes, he's been a disembodied voice on the phone, yes. but thank you. Welcome. Um, Ms. McDonald, can you still hear us? I can. Okay. So just let us know if you, uh, <coughs> excuse me, if you need to step away and <coughs> Okay, so uh, moving along to the next item on the agenda is the uh, dual language proposal, which we have been discussing for several months now. Um, this is a possible vote, uh, as was discussed at the last two meetings that we had. Um, and this is actually following, again, um, several months' worth of, of exploration, uh, conversations. There have been multiple visits that have, been taken, that have taken place, uh, members of this committee 
um, as well as the superintendent have gone and, and others across the district have gone and uh, visited uh, schools where they have dual language programs to try to understand this a little bit more. Many conversations had with educators and staff uh, in the district. And so it feels like a, a very long uh, journey to get here, but I'm glad we're here. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Morris. Sure, and uh, I won't make the same faux pas I made on the last topic, um, which is to say that this also is a topic that came and derived from the enrollment working group's work last year. Um, and I would say that over the last, this is, this is my 18th year in the district, this is the third time that the dual language, a dual language um, topic has come up at the elementary level. Uh, the first, I think, was 2004 or 5. And the next one was in 2009 and 10, and there was just the stars didn't align for a variety of reasons either time. Um, so um, when we talk about the next, the last year, year and a half, I also want to acknowledge that many people did work over many, many years on this and thinking about what made sense in the Amherst Public Schools and um, a, just a lot of the resources that were developed all the way back in those years were still utilized by the Enrollment Working Group. If you look at their report, they reference uh, multiple of the reports that predated them. So. Uh, while it may be new to some, it's also something that many in the community have uh, been discussing, uh, in, some, in some cases aspiring to, uh, over years. Um, to, to, to broaden the context, uh, you know, last year um, the report was came out. Uh, Phyllis Hardy from MABE, who's executive director of the Multi-State Association for Bilingual Education, came here in February. I'm not going to go through the whole context. Of, I know that would take a long time, but I think there's some touchstones that I want to I want to mention. Uh, came out and talked a bit about this. Uh, we decided to move forward with a further exploration. We planned a two-day retreat in the summer called La Siembra, uh, that um, primarily Fort River staff attended. I attended much of that as well. Uh, that was run by Mabe and folks who work for them, who currently are retired from dual language programs. Uh, the summer we had at least three meetings where we talked about zoning. Uh, we decided in the fall to come back with presentations about communication, academic program, and resources. And so I'm not going to go through all those slides. There's not that many slides tonight, uh, probably thankfully. Um, we went through a number of them. But what I tried to summarize is my current thinking as to why I'd make the recommendation that I'm making as contrasted to the prior presentation to actually make a change, a functional change in the structures of our uh, of our schools. And I'm saying schools in particular with a plural because yes, it's located, we plan to be located at Fort River School, but students from all schools uh, could have access through a lottery system. So just from our last meeting, we've had uh, just a summary, we've had nine family community engagements in the last five weeks, five at the preschool sites, one at Fort River, I think to PGO, and three at central locations. Um, mostly at the Jones Library, although I think uh, the PD Center as well serve that function. The one thing I want to note um, is that the conversations that were either, um, the, the meetings that were either conducted either primarily in Spanish or 100% in Spanish, I want to say that it wasn't just that families came and had different levels of participation, it's that because they were in Spanish, particularly the one at the preschool site, people were just, they were more willing to share about themselves, their culture, and their aspirations than if it was through translation. Um, there was something about being translated to that, uh, well, it funct it's functional, it doesn't allow for full communication. And I think there's so many ways that uh, I'm making then the connection, that's a metaphor for me for actually why we're talking about a dual language program, that uh, when we use translation, which we had available at all the meetings and what was utilized, the richness of the dialogue wasn't the same for the person who was not the, um, who was not the English speaker or not comfortable in English. And so I thought a lot, I've reflected a lot on why was the quality of the conversation different, and I can't get around the fact that being able to speak and, and, and potentially, as we think about students, instructed in students' home language, uh, and what a different experience that'll be for them. Not just on a, you know, when we'll get to graphs and we'll talk about achievement in a bit, just on a functional human level, uh, how different that'll be. Um, so I've done a lot of thinking, particularly, again, going to one of the preschool sites where there was a significant number of um, people whose first language was Spanish, and the quality was just different. So these are uh, most of the questions. We're 10 months away from potential implementation. So you know the good news is that the further along we get, the more questions we're able to answer more definitively. And yet we continue to want to receive questions that we can't, because that's pushing our thinking about the program. So I listed five questions. It's not that we don't have thoughts on them, but they were ones that we hadn't considered in, in close detail before. Um, there's a lot of interest in families having access to Spanish classes. Um, 
and we've, we have a good plan for staff if this vote passes, uh, but we hadn't really thought as deeply about families and how they might have access to Spanish language classes. So something we're still thinking about, um, how the change be communicated to current Fort River students, none of whom would be part of the dual language program. So that's something that's been an active part of the dialogue, and I want to thank Ms. Chamberlain and Ms. Richardson who have facilitated uh, a staff leadership group and then uh, also a parent group that's parent guardian group that's been connected to the program so these are things that often get pitched back to them to discuss with the staff and 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 then come up with solutions uh, one that was particularly novel well, how will families be supported to have one student do a language program and on one who is not either based on a different choice for the children or this question really derived from someone who uh, has an older child at Fort River so they would they would very much hope that their younger child was part of it. They believe in dual language. They're incredibly excited. And they're a little concerned about <coughs> the family themselves as bilingual. And if they're speaking Spanish at home, does the older sibling not have access to the dinner time conversation? And that's not something we've thought about in great detail. And so that's why we have these sessions. It's not just around communicating out. It's actually about receiving and pushing our thinking. Um, something we've spent a lot of time on, but it came up in a lot of the sessions was how the program specifically integrate culture and identity into students' social-emotional curriculum, the overall school culture. So for students in the monolingual English classroom, what are the benefits to them? How will uh, their cultures be recognized? How will non-Spanish speaking students' cultures be recognized, whatever that culture is, and how does that integrate? So uh, actually, Mabe's Spring Conference is centered on this very question. So we're doing a lot of thinking, but we also, lots of other schools are also doing a lot of thinking about the integration of culture, not just language. Uh, and one that we'd done some thinking about, but it was, it was probably asked a little sharper than uh, we had, where our thinking was, well, how would the assessment schedule look like in both languages? There was a concern that, well, if my student's getting, my child's getting assessed in English and Spanish, will they be just taking assessments all day long? Like, will it double the time and cut down on instruction time? So the answer is no, right, that we're not going to do double the assessments. At the same time, we have to think about and make very intentional choices along the way. Uh, what assessments happen when, uh, in which language, um, and being able to, to support students in their language acquisition, uh, both in English and Spanish. So that's just, uh, I put the ones we didn't have easy answers, right, I could put all the ones we had easy answers to, but that's already on an FAQ that's on our website, but um, really appreciate the families who came out. Um, our listserv, which is totally self-defined, of families who came, is over 70 families right now who wanted to stay connected to the program, and we continue to update them along the way. So the rationale, so why are we recommending a dual language program? So uh, kind of five basic principles. One is that it's responding to changing demographics of our students. And I'm not literally going to read the slides, but you can see that, <coughs> oh, bless you. Uh, we've talked about this in, in previous meetings with some graphs, uh, I think particularly last year with the enrollment working group, we had a number of those to talk about changing demographics. And I could mention and go on for what we've done to, to respond to the changing demographics, but. Uh, someone pushed me recently, what have you done structurally to respond to the changing demographics? And I could talk about professional development, I could talk about outreach, I could talk about um, translation devices, I've talk, I could talk a lot about a lot of things, but truly structurally instructionally, um, this is a much larger change than what we've done in the past. And as you'll see, there's a slide that's not in your packet, um, just of what the research evidence suggests around this, but, but I do feel like these demographic changes are not minor, they're major, and they're, uh, it's on our, ethically, we need to respond structurally to the changes. Uh, second is, as a district, we're deeply committed to reducing or eliminating the achievement gap. We know in Massachusetts, well, it's you know, number one in the nation for achievement, and there's lots of banners over at DESE around that, and, and for good reason, we're proud of that. We also have among the highest achievement gaps between uh, English learners and non-English learners of any state in the country. Uh, I can get very political and talk about question two from the early 2000s and the elimination of uh, exactly what we're trying to do, which is being able to instruct in Spanish. Uh, and I could go down that road, but I'm going to, in the name of time, I'll just suggest that I believe that contributes to the achievement gap that we have. Um, we have many program strengths, we have incredible ELL teachers, and yet uh, we're not pleased that the achievement gap we still have. Um, we're, we mirror the state in many ways in terms of our work. And the next slide with the visual, I'm sorry, was I didn't have time to get in the packet. We'll kind of, I think, visually show that. And the reason is, you know, when we look at our English learners of any, whose first language is, but no matter what their first language is, building their academic skills and maintaining their first language skills is critical for second language development. 
our, our, EAL, our English learners who come in with high levels of academic fluency in their first language generally do pretty well in our schools. They're generally not in the ELL program for very long and they have high rates of success. For our English learners who come in and don't have access to continued development and don't have access to academic background in their first language, uh, they're often our students who we, who we, despite our best efforts, linger in our English learner program a little longer than we want and don't, even when they exit, they don't reach the level of achievement that we want them to achieve. And this, this dual language programs are proven to change that dynamic for that population. The third is our expression of the district's commitment to social justice, right? So it's not just about the language, it's about the culture. You all have heard me say that basically every presentation where we talk about this. Uh, every district I visit talks not about just the language and the achievement, but about the cultural uh, benefits of having this program. And for us, it's very consistent. For me, it's very consistent with what our commitment is. Um, our experience from site visits, right? So I've been on three to three of these locations. Um, and staff and school member have been to the fourth in Holyoke. And no program was the same, but every school was excited to have us come, excited to showcase their program, whether it has been a 35-year program or it just started and they were working through um, some growing pains along the way. Uh, and in every district that we talked to, which is much larger than the ones we visited, uh, we couldn't get them off the phone to talk about the academic and social benefits. And that doesn't happen much in education, right? We can think of any critical topic in education. The more districts you talk about, we made this decision, we didn't like it, we changed our curriculum in mathematics or language arts. Um, I don't have, and I think I've said this before, I don't often have the experience of calling places and people calling me back immediately and me having to leave them because they want to tell me how wonderfully this is working out for the students, particularly around the dimensions of the achievement gap and the demographics. And finally, we've had incredibly strong positive feedback from our family sessions. Um, the interest is high, the questions are many, which is what we'd want. Um, but the feedback we've received has been uh, pretty close to entirely positive, which again, for anything we're proposing that's new or a structural shift is not necessarily what we um, experience. Um, and I think the graph, I just wanted to fill out, I don't think I've shown this one before, I don't think you've seen it. So this is a graph uh, researched by Thomas and Collier. Um, and um, so you can see on the bottom of those, a little blurry, there's 700,000 uh, EL students in five large districts across the country. And what it's looking at is English reading performance. And the thing that's not on this chart is uh, for the top bar, which is the red, and the two-way dual language program, what we're proposing uh, that has the highest achievement, it's for students who are in the program for five years, right? So generally it's the elementary school experience and then they uh, oftentimes in this research went back to a more traditional middle school, high school model. And so this shows the reading performance, uh, the dotted line where the 50% is, is the average reading performance of native English speakers or uh, people who have kids who have English as their first language. And on the right, you see a number of different methods. Um, and, and I don't mean just to be critical of some of our current methods, which mostly focus on content-based ESL. Um, you can see there's significantly better outcomes than no services, but they're also significantly low. And this really mirrors in Massachusetts the result of English learners, right? So this research comes from multiple states, and yet it's exactly what we see in Massachusetts, and, and frankly what we see locally. We're a little better than the state in, most, in some ways, but, um, and the two-way dual language programs that you could see, uh, not only does it get to the achievement gap, which would be getting to 50%, in their research it surpasses the achievement gap. So these students are achieving above grade level by the time they hit middle school and high school. And so for us, who are so deeply committed to this population and, and really uh, feeling like we are doing all that we can do within our current constraints, this shows us that there's something else that we can do that has wildly different results. Um, so I'm sorry this didn't make it into the packet. Um, we've talked about this research orally, but I thought it might be helpful to see the, the graph of that. Yeah. So before I continue, I thought I might pause and see if there's questions from the committee. Does anyone have questions for the committee? And, and Ms. McDonald, I'm gonna give you uh, first dibs if you have a question, just because I know it's a lot harder for you to be hanging on the phone. I apologize. <laughs> I'll make sure I email it before I leave tonight, but essentially what it's showing is uh, the outcomes for uh, English language learners in different models, no services, ESL pullout, content-based ESL, 
um, some bilingual education with, con you know, some, some hybrid models that include bilingual education as well as some others, and then some dual language programs. And the dual language programs are the only model that uh, eliminates the achievement gap, and the differences between dual language programs and other models is pretty significant. So that'd be my oral summary, but I absolutely will share this with you electronically uh, before the night is done. Sorry, I made a decision about 10 minutes before the meeting started to include this, so. Um. Uh, so, opening it up to the rest of the committee, any questions or comments for Dr. Morris? Okay. More presentation. Oh, more presentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, moving along. <laughs> okay, so uh, last time we looked at budget fiscal investment and I was asked to come back with a little more finite and specific numbers. The thing I want to note is these are budget additions, um, and one I'll talk about is, is really um, a redistribution of priorities. Um, last time there was a slide on resources that talked about program coordination, and that is not a budget ad. It's a reorganization of central office uh, and FTE, so we are committed to having a part-time program coordinator, uh, but we can do that without impacting the budget based on um, our central office um, current central office staffing that, in the budget that was approved last spring. So it's not on here because it's not a budget um, suggestion, you know, budget impact, but I do want to, I don't want me to say and us to say how important that is and then and not to be reflected on this document. So uh, we expect the annual increase to the appropriated budget to be $14,000. Uh, that's primarily, in, that is curriculum materials and classroom display materials. The second, um, second line down professional development, professional slash curriculum development, what we are currently using is Title IIA grants. That's a federal grant that's designated specifically for professional development. And we also often um, supplement that with existing curriculum lines in the appropriated budget. Being that this is a major priority of the district, we've been able to do that this year without a budget ad, and we would look to continue to do that. Um, the signage that we talked about, um, what we look to do is one of two things, a capital request for FY20, um, so for the next fiscal year. Um, to be honest, based on the fiscal one quarter, the book quarterly report we received, we'd look to see if we're able to do some of that with this year's funds. Um, we don't know that yet. We'll know that better after the second quarter budget update that Mr. Mangano will do in January. Thank you. And we'll have a better sense of exactly where we're sitting. Uh, but in any case, it wouldn't be on the appropriate side of the budget because um, the dollar amount's significant enough to be on capital. Um, and so our total ad that we'd be asking for in the budget process is 14000 And the reason it says fiscal investment is on the bottom right. The cost of one Amherst charter school student, uh, one student from our town attending charter school is over $20,000. Um, and that's not, I want to be really clear, this, the goal of this program is not to fiscal. Um, it's not like our goal is, um, the goal is about the students and particularly the English language learners. And this is a slide about fiscal Im impact and investment. So I want to be really cautious about that because one is way more important to me than the other. It's not, obviously I create budgets, we have a budget cycle, but if it was just a budget saving mechanism, I wouldn't have the same passion um, and make, perhaps making the same recommendation the same way. Um, but I want to be really clear that I have to think about the fiscal thing. It feels actually sort of odd to do it and, and way secondary to the prior slides. Um, but I, um, the next slide sort of talks a little bit about the Mr. fiscal Thomas, investment. Yeah. I just wanted to, yeah. I mean, so I thank you for bringing that point up because I, I, I feel like so sometimes in the community when we talk about dual language, like, oh, you're doing that to compete with the charter schools. And it's, it's not, I think it's important to reemphasize that if that's not the, the point of it. <laughs> Although it's interesting, you know, it's, if even one family chooses this program, it pays for itself. It's like, <laughs> that's how ridiculously out of skew the charter tuition formula is, that one student would pay for the entire budget appropriation. So, um, but yes. Mr. Nakajima. I'm, I'm just going to make, I, I mean, I agree entirely with where you're coming from philosophically, but in terms of the slide, uh, I'll make the counter argument. Um, given the fact that we had to cut our budget this past year, and goodness knows what's going to happen this year, I think for the committee to be looking at making, uh, you know, approving a budget right. and doing a budget ad, it's entirely appropriate to say there might actually be a net benefit fiscally um, if we're able to encourage families to keep their 
or their kids in the district. I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying that. You shouldn't apologize for it yeah. because I, kn I know that's not the reason right. uh, any of you are recommending it. Yeah. Nor is it why I think the committee's been excited in the past. Yeah. But, it, but if we're going to have to add something to the budget, then good. Yeah. There's a good fiscal case to be made. Yep, and to add to that fiscal case, thank you. Um, so this is the enrollment working group survey uh, that they did. And I just, one of the really nice things they did on their survey is they had a very good response rate. And they then pulled the responses for families with young children. So they had like a di different, you know, they had the pre-K to six responses. And then they had, I think it was pre-K and K. It was over 100 responses. And 77% of those, and I know I'm reading the slide, but I think it's worth reading the slide. 77% of those expressed <coughs> being very interested in having instruction in Spanish. And the second bullet point is the little more shocking one to me, is that 65% of respondents reported considering sending their child to a school outside ARPS. And, and by shocking, it's just that was more than I would have guessed. It's not, there's no critique in it. It's just I wouldn't have guessed a majority. And that 80% of those respondents, so 80% of the 65%, to be clear on the data, indicated that having a Spanish dual language program would make them more likely to attend the district. So the odds that one family in the district would, would get into the program and choose to come here seems like a conservative estimate of the financial impact. And uh, this was the survey that the district did, the bottom one, of Amherst families who send their children to charter schools. And at the elementary, when it was done, the only charter school that they were sending them to, that's changed a little bit, was the um, Chinese charter school in Hadley, that 89% of the respondents, so I think it was 25 of 28, maybe the math's a little off on that, but it was a very high number of respondents specifically said in an open-ended question that the importance of the dual language program was critical to their choice. You know, there was, uh, it was by far the hardest, there was a forced choice and by, fi the, by far the highest response was unique program. There was some, you know, variable as unique program, much more than building facilities, other things. Um, and so when, you know, the slide before, I'm hard pressed to think that we won't, that, that the, it won't be fiscally um, self-sustaining you know, if not net positive to the district. Um, so, so here are some key next steps if approved. Um, so we have a schedule, meeting scheduled. Ms. Chamberlain already scheduled that for Thursday uh, with the faculty staff. Uh, we met on Friday morning prior uh, with the faculty staff. Um, we've been communicating via email, just some feedback and update uh, from that meeting, which I thought was incredibly productive and positive. Uh, and we do have to apply for the approval. So now that the Look Act happened, I think it was Thursday of last week, they came out with the, um, you know, the documents to apply. You know, Mabe has been assisting them, and Mabe is very savvy. And the work we did in La Siembra is wonderfully attuned to exactly what we have to produce for the application for DESI. Um, they're using Mabe as consultants to help them with um, all their work at DESI because just capacity-wise, Mabe has a lot of background knowledge. Um, so I just want to be clear that we do have to do that, um, but Mabe has assured us that it's not, from their vantage point, we're, we're well in good shape with that. Um, we'll continue the dual language leadership group and work in professional development as, the, as well as collaboration with Mabe. The, for instance, the leadership group next meets two days from now on Wednesday, so hopefully, I um, know. For me, hopefully, personally, we're doing some <coughs> celebration um, and continuing the work. Um, I think that's on the agenda, actually. Uh, hopefully, celebration and continue the work. Um, we have to hire staffing for the program, um, and we imagine that our, our aim is to be do that to be done sooner, but we'll, we want to make sure that we're done with that at the end of January, uh, just because we don't exactly know who will apply, and particularly for the Spanish side, uh, we want to make sure that we're doing full vetting of um, if it's not someone internal of their of that candidate, the candidate speaking skills, language skills, um, and making sure they have experience teaching in Spanish, um, so that that process may be a little more extended than our typical posting process is, because we we need to get that right. Um, we are ready of uh, ready to go on my list of things to do tomorrow. If there's a positive vote, is uh, GCC has been working on a Spanish for Education staff members course, and we plan for that course to be one day a week, and starting in January, it'll be a full calendar year, so January to December. Uh, it will plan to open it for anyone in the district, but it will house it at Fort River because that's going to be the primary area that um, it makes sense to have it. But Greenfield GCC is Greenfield Community College, and they've developed many courses. Sorry about that. Many courses uh, around language that are specific to occupations. So they have a very popular um, Spanish for healthcare professionals course, for instance, they use in places where nurses and others are, are working, uh, and there's a need for more communication. They really gear it specifically for the role. 
So we've been making some curriculum decisions. We want to finalize those in March. Uh, we are hoping if we have a positive second quarter budget update actually to get in a cycle where we're purchasing the curriculum the year before so there's time for all that work to be done before kids let out and that will put us on a seven year cycle of being able to do that. We'd still make the same budget ads. We just would then have the money banked to buy the first grade materials in the middle of next year and so on and so forth and we're feeling good. We did reserve some funds at the curriculum lines and we're feeling optimistic and, and pretty confident actually about that. Um, we want to have more family engagement events with finalized schedule, um, staffing and curriculum information well prior to registration. Um, essentially once the staffing's done we want to kick those off because um, our meetings so far have been about the program and we need to shift our focus to the program and children, uh, which is a, a little different if we, we have an affirmative vote. Uh, registration will occur at its normal timeline, but we'll have the additional dimension of having families, no matter where they live, either opt uh, to express interest in the program and if they're not at Fort River, uh, to opt into a lottery kind of system. Enrollment lottery will play out in early June uh, after our registration and screening process. And uh, we're looking to name the dual language program before students get out. We'd like to think of ways for current students as well as families to be involved in the naming process. Uh, my experience in general is that students come up with better names than their adults. They are, they are accompanying adults, myself included. Um, and so we have current Fort River students who we think could play a large role in what the program is named. Uh, and we'd like for the signage to be installed before this school year gets back. This is a summary. There's, I could fill out five slides of the more smaller, the smaller details, but um, I tried to pick on the big ones that would inform the larger community. And we developed motion language for your consideration. So, um, and, and I know other people are here, we're open to any questions that might come up. So, we we'll turn to the committee. Um, any questions or comments for Dr. Morris? Mr. Demling. Yeah, just like a procedural <coughs> question. Um, just throwing it up there, should, would you like to, should we read the motion first and then discuss it? It seems like sometimes we do the opposite, <laughs> where we have a big discussion, then we read the motion, and then there's well, no further discussion. Well, my preference is generally, if we're going to have a vote, that we actually have uh, the vote read, but if there's any technical questions or anything like that, that maybe we want to get out of the way first, Mr. Dr. Morris would be okay right. with that, you know, but it's up to the committee. I had a couple of questions about the presentation. Go for so it. So I will, um, I guess my first, um, actually I shouldn't have said a couple, I think it's really just one. Um, so I wouldn't have entered into this conversation about the charter schools except we just talked about the charter schools. And so I'm looking at the calendar now and I see that the enrollment lottery is going to be early June 2019. How does that align or have you considered how that aligns with the um, Chinese immersion charter school if that's our goal to Right, so uh, it doesn't totally align uh, or fully align for the lottery for families who are not current Fort River families. Um, just to put a finer point on it, because Fort River families, we believe, will have full access uh, regardless of a lottery. And some of the thinking behind that is we want to make sure that uh, our lottery, perhaps a little more complicated, I know at, at charter schools it's siblings and then just a random lottery, and ours we want to take into account language background, language language acquisition, uh, and and I'm just going to speak plainly because I don't need to speak around this. So I do think there's going to be families who apply for both, and maybe committing to one. It's not like a college where we ask for a deposit, nor is it at the Chinese Charter School. So I think for families who apply to both and get into a charter school and then get into our school, I don't think there's going to be a conflict. And we heard feedback from this from a couple of families. It's not the first time this question's come up. <laughs> and what I don't want to do is um, kind of contort our system to make decisions before we get good screening information. We have more time for families to talk, um, talk through it. Um, so I do think because there's not a, I mean, private schools perhaps is a little different, but for charter schools, it's not a deposit system. So families could, you know, theoretically make a commitment. And this happens all the time. You know, we have families come back routinely who register one place and then they, yeah, you know, for whatever reason, I'm impressed by the school, bus transportation is really important to me, whatever the, the thing is. So that's sort of where we have landed with it. Um, I think we'd be hard pressed to do it on a timeline that's earlier in the spring because we don't feel like we'd have all the information. And frankly, uh, we don't have all the kids. Not everyone registers at the time that in early March because families move here and a whole variety of factors. And we want to our focus on getting the demographic mix right is sort of 
superseding, perhaps rushing the process to move it quicker. Mm -hmm. Earlier, I should say. Mr. Dr. Uh, I move uh, that the Amherst School Committee uh, support the superintendent's recommendation to implement a dual language program beginning in the 2019-2020 school year with the following specifications. Spanish and English will be the partner languages. The program will be implemented in kindergarten only in 2019-2020 school year. One additional grade level will be added each year through grade six. The program will be based at Fort River with a lottery process to allow participation of students from other Amherst elementary schools as space permits, and the program will prioritize Spanish-speaking English, English learners in lottery as per the mission of the program. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Miss um, <clears throat> McDonald, do you have any questions or further comments? just want to give you the chance to speak first. Um, yeah, thank you. I, um, I asked in one of the earlier presentations, and it's about, um, it, it, I think that it's not the same as the lingering question that um, Dr. Morrissey addressed about families having access to Spanish classes, but really thinking about that third classroom at each grade level that will not be part of the dual language program. Um, and I go back to that because I really, one, one thing that really struck me from that, that evening's presentation was the, the idea of the multilingual mindset, which I absolutely love. And, and I, I, I sort of, I feel like that should be a mindset that we have in all of our schools, not just the, the school that happens to have the dual language program, because we have so many students that come with um, different languages. Um, and that, that multilingual mindset could benefit all of our students, whether it's regardless of the curriculum program they're in. Um, but that said, that multilingual mindset, I feel like we, we're leaving out the students that, whose families opt for the English only classroom, whether they're English learners themselves that are non-Spanish-speaking families or English-speaking families that just for whatever reason choose not to, to participate, we're, uh, by not offering them a pathway <coughs> to learn Spanish in a, in a more formalized instruction, I, I worry that eventually in the first couple of years it's not going to be as noticeable because it's only going to be one grade level or two grade levels, but as it, as it grows throughout the school, it could become an issue of feeling like that, that there's a separate but less than equal classroom track within the school because they're not getting that pathway. And the fact is is that the, in the elementary school, the students, they're required to sit and eat lunch with their own classroom. For most assemblies, they sit with their classroom there too. So the opportunities for them to mix and mingle and learn from their peers that are in the dual language program won't be as, as great as they are now where students are mixing classes every year. Um, you're going to have a group of kindergartners that start in kindergarten in a monolingual classroom, and they're going to be with that cohort every single year. Um, <laughs> you know, there's going to be kids moving and, and leaving and, and coming into the district, but they're, but they're going to be with that group of kids. Um, and if there really isn't a way for them to access Spanish learning, Spanish language learning, I worry that it will make them feel a little bit isolated and sort of not as inclusive as, as we might hope. So I just, I, I, I'm not looking for an answer now. I don't think it's, it's necessary in the first year because it's just going to be one grade level. But it's something that I would ask that we, that we come back to in the future and think about how are we going to make that multilingual mindset something that is um, apparent in every classroom, not just, not just sort of in the dual language program. And, and hope that the kids in the non non dual language programs sort of come along. Um, I I think that it would be important for maintaining that inclusive school environment for all of the kids in all of the classrooms to have some pathway for the students and and potentially their parents if that's if that's part of the program to access Spanish language learning. Thank you. Uh, do you want to comment on that or? If, if there's a follow-up from okay. a committee member, Mr. I can Mr. wait. Kajima? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I th it's going to be brief, which is to say we have mm -hmm. spoken to other schools in a strand. So out of, you know, some of the schools we've spoken to and visited, it was the whole school, like Cambridge and then Princeton, Harrisonburg, other places, it was a strand within the school, which is more common in our MSN partner districts. And I think uh, it's something that I know Ms. Chamberlain and Ms. Richardson have talked a lot about is how does it 
you know, how do we have some differences because they're different academic programs and, and then what brings all students together. And, you know, one of the best things that I appreciate the lens is one of our earlier presentations, Ms. Chamberlain and uh, Ms. Richardson shared the mission of the school and then mission of the program and the, the lack, the, the connection rather, um, between though, uh, those were, was readily apparent. So how to actualize that is something that we're actively talking about, thinking about, and it comes up in most meetings I'm in on the topic with the leadership team, is how do we retain the identity of Fort River and bring it along collectively. So separate from language, I would, uh, part of the other conversation that we have is the cultural aspects of what we talked about that don't have to do with specific language. How do all students have access and all students feel part of the culture of the school? And um, to me, that's actually, um, as the school moves into kind of a more direct, explicit focus on culture, that's something that has to happen in all the classrooms at Fort River, including the ones that are there now. Uh, and then Ms. Chamberlain's been leading that work over the last couple of years. So if there was a no vote tonight, it's not like Ms. Chamberlain would say, oh no, we're not gonna focus on culture. That's, that's part of what Fort River is and it's what's the work that needs to happen uh, for every classroom. So I know it's not getting specifically at the linguistic piece because I think that's a larger conversation we can have, um, but the cultural piece and making sure that all students feel connected to the larger school is, is an active conversation. Uh, so I, I really appreciate the presentation. I think one of the nice things about it is that it gets more specific over time. So when you look, I mean, I, I appreciate that you said behind every uh, item in the in the schedule of, of acti future activities, there's a deeper set or nested set of, of descriptors that you could share with us. Um, I think just seeing laid out for us and then obviously made available to the public what those steps are uh, gives me a good sense that um, we're organized to execute, because obviously the key thing is, is that we're able to do that. One thing that is, I think, probably in, in, I was thinking about this a lot, but I think it echoes well what Ms. McDonald's was just saying, is, and I'd love to hear your thought on this, I'd also love to hear uh, the principal's thought on this, if she's interested, is, um, you know, how jazzed up are you for this? And have you built in the cognitive and schedule space <laughs> to make it work. Because in the end, there are going to be a million things that come up um, from parents, from staff, that <laughs> facility-wise, things that are coming up like this, like, like kids from families who choose not to participate for whatever reason, but in fact, then they start getting this sense of, yeah, but I want to be part of this community. How do I get a part of it? And one of the challenges for any organization, and this is true, I'm sure, for schools, is that once you get into an impl implementation mode, there, the, you could get mentally into a mode of saying, well, I got between now and next August to get these 30 things done, and man, I'm plowing ahead. And yet, to me, that's exactly the worst, which is my personal opinion, yeah, yeah. the exact worst way to build something that's embedded within a living, breathing, organic community, an organization, a community, a school, but also is going to have to evolve over time and is, in fact, going to get better over time. And that only happens, I mean, so I know it's not just about the intent, which is part of how, well, how jazzed up you are, hopefully, um, but it's also about whether, you get, whether you're building in structurally the cognitive and resource space, not just money, but time and staffing, to be able to figure out how to hear actively and sympathetically these issues when they come up and think about exciting and creative ways to use them as positive building blocks as opposed to a, holy crap, it's only October of the first year and now we're getting negative feedback and oh my God, this is terrible. And you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, I do. So I, in a, you know. Yeah, I'll start and then if you want to jump in, you're welcome to, um, either you or Ms. Richardson. So jazzed, yes. Uh, I think that, that you know, is clear. I've been a little more subdued because it's a potential vote, but I think you've seen me a little more boisterous in earlier meetings um, talking about this. But I think uh, I added the graph uh, and I went back and forth whether to add the graph in the presentation. And part of the reason I ended up doing it is uh, when we think about the achievement gap, just being able to, to have one chart that shows the potential impact is huge and I think we do so much good in this district and the staff do an incredible job and one of the main parts of my job is to eliminate structures that are not promoting us to move the needle on the achievement gap, right? Some of it's like about programming and for me, 
kind of an odd statement, but this is, for me, removing a artificial structure that American schools have used, right, teaching only in English, uh, in Massachusetts in particular, the last 15 years, that's getting in the way of what everyone wants, which is elimination of the achievement gap. In this case, you know, particularly focus on Spanish-speaking students and families. And so that gets me jazzed. And, and what was interesting when I met with staff on Friday at Fort River is both in the meeting, but particularly after the meeting, um, there were a number of legitimate <laughs> implementation questions that arose, as they should, 10 months before something gets implemented. And the, the qualification everyone, every staff member said is, I really want to see this program work so well for kids. And how are you going, right? I mean, it was like the framing of it was that there was a firm commitment because of the, the perceived benefits of the program that we've got to get this right. We have to have the, the right <coughs> staffing models. We have to have the support in the schools. And I really appreciate the Fort River staff for having that framing because it, one could imagine a different conversation with a different staff. Right, um, And that was not my experience, and it continues not to be my experience. In terms of structures, I really want to thank Ms. Richardson and Ms. Chamberlain, because they've set up internal structures around a leadership team, inviting parents into that group. Visit to Holyoke not only involves staff and school committee, but also parents who are interested. And that, that outreach and that effort is, is, to your point, I think, what will continue to make the, the work um, happen at, uh, in the right way. Um, and you know, absent this ongoing leadership group, um, I don't, I'd be really concerned about it. Um, something so we have to keep our eye on, but I think the, ex the best example I could use is the Google Docs that we did at La Siembra, and I've told the story here before, but not everyone might have been here. So uh, the way La Siembra works is they create Google Docs based on research-based um, how to implement dual language programs guides. And what Mabe reported is they go to many communities and they spend two days in the summer and they go back in the Google Docs, uh, and Google Docs, for those people who don't know, is a live editing tool. So if I'm not on there, if someone else is in the audience, right, if we're all shared on this doc and Caridad does some work, that I can see that work happen. And what's a very frustrating experience for them <laughs> is most of the places they do this, nothing, not much happens between the, the, the moment they leave and their next visit some point in the fall. And what Mabe reported to Ms. Chamberlain and I is they kept on going back and be like, oh my God, there's, there's new pages here, right? There's, there's this group that's doing ongoing work that's deeply considering the issues. Um, and, and I expect that to continue for, the, for not just the next 10 months, but the next number of years as we implement the program that there's, a, there's an uh, established leadership group uh, that has good processes to make decisions about curriculum, curriculum learning, about communication, about outreach. Um, so that's what gives me confidence in our ability to pull, pull this off in a good way. But I want to own that it's really Ms. Richardson and Ms. Chamberlain's um, leadership. I've, I'm, I think my first time in that group will be Wednesday. It's really the, the school-based folks and the staff who have been taking that on. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add. Don't feel like you need to if you have nothing to add. <laughs> I'm gonna hold for now, thanks. Okay. So I uh, I actually have a, a couple of questions. Um, so this is something that I've raised in previous meetings. And it's really regarding staffing, and I heard you mention it uh, before. You know, I think um, making sure that we have uh, not just you know, support for staff currently, but that we're also thinking about how to attract, um, I'm thinking primarily about the Spanish-speaking yeah. staff, right? How to attract, you know, high-quality high um, Spanish speakers who are trained educators. And, you know, preferably, I think, from our local communities. Um, and, I, and I say this because in the visit that I made to the Holyoke School, uh, one thing that, that struck me was the principal talking about how uh, they have been challenged to find Spanish-speaking educators, quite challenged, in fact, um, and according to what we heard, have had to uh, appeal to the Spanish embassy to help bring over qualified educators from Spain, um, and we've also put out sort of a global search. You know, and, and while I appreciate the creativity in that, um, and think it's you know it's 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 great that they have that kind of reach. Uh, sometimes I wish we had that kind of reach for a whole bunch of different things. Uh, I also feel that you know when you're thinking about culture and how that's a good cultural fit or a bad cultural fit, it leaves a, a little bit of a vacuum there because we're not going to assume that 
you know, European uh, educators, for example, have the same experience or even the, speak the same language that a lot of these Spanish-speaking students might speak at home yeah. with their families, right? Some of them, maybe, um, but not, not all of them. And so, you know, I think there's a certain um, experience there. You know, we talked a lot about that cultural fit, right. which is really important. And so I'm, I'm hoping that that is something that is, is being thought through and there's a plan in place, because I haven't to be perfectly honest, heard the plan. I just heard, you know, we're, we're thinking about it and we've, you know, we're talking about it, but I haven't heard what the plan is to make sure that we are attracting, you know, qualified, right. preferably local staff, or that we've, you know, we're getting folks here um, who match our students, right? So that's just the first um, thing. And then the second thing was, in thinking about this, um, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that there's going to be the Spanish for Education staff members uh, you know, so a year-long workshop. I think it's really important for staff to be uh, engaged in that way to that degree. But I'm also wondering if there's any cultural sensitivity training that goes along with that, right? And if there's an aspect of that workshop that also includes uh, not just language, but that also includes the you know a lot of the the social equity uh, based issues and thinking that we've been doing in this district. Um, because I think that in addition to learning the language, it's also about educators and staff understanding the reasons why we're doing this and the value behind it, right? And, and I think most of them, if not all of them, are already on board. Uh, but it's, it's just a different level of engagement and thoughtfulness that would go into, you know, and asking themselves and asking all, our, all of ourselves, I think, questions about, uh, you know, why this is important for us and why we're doing this, right? And hoping that everyone has the right framing in mind so that when they, um, set foot in that door that very first day when the program, you know, is is implemented, if it's implemented, um, that they're ready to go, right? And so I, I was just hoping that you could talk a little bit more about that, about those two things, and, sure. you know, if there's any thought that you put into that. Yeah, so in terms of the staffing piece, um, I think one of the reasons is we do have some staff in the district who have the skill set to perhaps want to do this and you know whether they want to be do it in kindergarten or upper grade level uh, we may you know have to look outside the district and we may not for the first year or two and so I want to be cautious because it's you know we're talking about a relatively small group of people and, and identify but you know that kind of pieces and I don't want to feel like there's any pressure being put by the district but I think that's the first slice of it I think at a broader slice uh, one of the things that we've heard from multiple districts um, is exactly what you say, that there is this kind of Spanish embassy route and it's not for our population necessarily the most preferred route to go down. Um, some of the places have found that particularly there's a lot of um, folks who are coming from Puerto Rico um, for a whole host of reasons who um, have been good fits in their programs uh, as well as Puerto people from the Caribbean who live in this general area. Um, so our plan would be to engage MABE. We've already started doing that. Um, they do do postings for um, districts who are MABE partner districts, which we are now becoming a MABE partner district. Um, and then to do broad outreach, you know, in local communities, posting in some of the typical places, but also posting in some of the atypical places as well. Uh, and what we find in general is word of mouth is um, shockingly still a very effective strategy. So we know there are teachers who are bilingual who would love to teach in Spanish who are teaching in partner or in neighboring districts in Western Massachusetts. And our task is to let the larger Western Massachusetts area know, because that would be the ideal situation, uh, that we have this position and that it is exclusively teaching in Spanish uh, and that might Amherst is a desirable district to work in. Um, and so the challenge of not trying to poach people, but at the same time, if people want to make this job change because, oh, great, I get to teach in Spanish with a uh, heavily Latino population, that's really attractive to me, that, 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 only, that possibly only exists in two districts west of 495, right? Um, and so trying to really get the word out through word of mouth through some of our staff members, even if they teach at the upper grade levels and they would never, or secondary schools and they would never choose to teach kindergarten or first grade, where are their networks, their professional networks, where we can get the word out. Um, so, um, and you know, frankly, we do have some families that we know of who have been in touch with us, with families in Puerto Rico, and it may be worth. There are job fairs down there, and um, I have my own. I have a lot of ethical issues with sometimes with these things, but I just am concerned about the island. And at the same time, if families want, if teachers want to leave and they want to come to the mainland, and this seems like a great job, uh, we want to make sure that our we're in touch with contacts down there 
as well. So we're trying to spread our um, spread the word wide, and that's not only particularly for this role. I mean, I want to say that we're also thinking about years ahead and other roles that we have to fill, and we're constantly looking for bilingual staff members. So being part of a district that has a dual language program, even if they're going to teach in English for four years until until you know we get up to third or fourth grade, uh, that can be a really exciting thing for someone to plan, work on, and then be part of. And the cultural aspects of the school changing as well, something that may be very attractive to staff members. So we're trying to um, let the word fly to many places, and both specifically and more generally. Um, but uh, if I was a betting person, the word of mouth piece of our staff talking to other um, people in their networks is a significant uh, and um, significant effort and a variable that shouldn't be underestimated in addition to all the formal ways of posting and getting Mabe, you know, to post for us on their website, all those other things. Uh, we, we have a fair number of bilingual staff members, and even if they're never going to teach kindergarten, they know other, they're more likely to know other bilingual folks who may be interested. So that was long-winded, but then the second question was, now I lost it, oh, cultural sensitivity training. So we wouldn't rely on GCC for that. Uh, theirs is very focused on the language aspect of it, um, just to be really clear on what they're able to offer. Uh, but certainly these are active conversations that have gone on just in fairness at Fort River since Russ Vernon Jones was principal and I was hired in 2001. And the change in student demographics that will accompany this will need to push us to be one level higher um, and go deeper on the cultural um, and multicultural education aspects. So it's something that is we are very attuned to, and I know the leadership team has talked about, um, not just in the language piece and the academic, quote unquote, academic pieces, but how do we have a plan to, to really work on that cultural aspects as well? Um, I do think that's happening. I think if you look at the planning that we talked about for superintendent update, is it solely focused on uh, Latino or Spanish speaking students? No. Is it all getting, is the theme the same? Uh, I believe it is. And even the, the beginning of the meeting tomorrow will focus on um, we all have to educate, advocate for every child. So we can't rely on um, oppressed groups to be the only ones advocating for themselves. Uh, we need to, no matter who you are, be an advocate, a uh, staunch advocate in what every single child needs. And I said this a convocation is one adult who's irrationally crazy about that child. And that's what we need to get to with this program and understanding what students bring to our schools as a, a strength-based model is the way we've approached that. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions or comments for Dr. Morris? Ms. Bitzer? I mean, this is a big vote, so I, I can't let it go without making a comment. Um, um, and I'd like to, you know, say I, I share a lot of the concerns expressed, but I'd also like to say that I'm just really excited that we're making, um, hopefully, I, I think, we haven't talked about this at all, <laughs> but hopefully, um, you know, I, I'm excited about um, voting for this tonight. And I guess the one thing, you know, just to add to the list of things I'd want to make sure we're, we're looking at as we move forward is just how we're going to make sure that we're implementing and evaluating, you know, like as somebody who does a little bit of evaluation work, um, does Mabe assist with that? They do. They do. Okay, great. Because yeah. I think I think um, it's so exciting and seeing like the research that that's been done on this. There's clearly always a need for more, and I um, especially for we're going to be having some random assignment through a lot of it. I don't think we'll have big enough numbers to actually do any comparisons. But and 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 that the evaluation not only focus on the impact on the kids who are in the program, but maybe considering. I mean, Allison's raised some valid concerns, I think, for the other classroom, and I think we should make sure that we're tuned in to, to keeping an eye on how those kids are doing, too. Um, and then, I guess, just also, just, uh, I think that kind of reflection would help as we, you know, I, I'm really optimistic about this, and optimistic that it'll hopefully grow over time. Yeah. So, um, I think that kind of learning would help as we, as, as we hopefully embrace this model and if we find that it does produce the outcomes that we think it will that you know hopefully we could have good reason to to expand so thank you so much for everybody who's worked on this um i'm really excited about it thank you any mr gentleman so yeah so I, I agree with everything that's been said about how should we responsibly implement this and what are the things we want to look out for as we evolve this thing that will continue to evolve and change um as to the motion about you know whether we support this or not um I, for one, am pretty jazzed up about it. Um, I, I feel like um, one of the core things uh, that we should be doing on school committee is is keeping a sharp and continual focus on the achievement gap. I feel like sometimes um, 
it's such a difficult problem and such an all pervasive problem uh, with with so many dimensions. You know, special ed, low income, Hispanic, African American, ELL. It's it's a tough nut to crack all around. And so when something comes along that shows real promise for shutting the door on the achievement gap for a particular group like nothing we've ever done before, I feel like that's like the, the driver. I feel like we have an obligation to push the envelope in that respect. Um, I'm, I'm very gratified to feel like we're really well prepared. I've, I liked reading Mabe's letter about uh, their opinion about how prepared we are. Not to say there won't be bumps in the road, but um, you know, I, I think I would vote for this even if we were less prepared than we are at the moment right now, because I feel like there's enough sincere, creative, smart, hardworking attention on this that it will, it's, it's, it's going to um, be implemented and implemented well. Um, you know, like, like I, I think about similar things that we do for, 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 for other groups to support other students. You know, it's like we, we don't have to invest in the family center, but we choose to do that because, because that's, that's a, we see that as, as core to our mission, as, as part of our moral obligation as a district. You know, we don't, we don't have to continually push the envelope about all the different ways we offer special education, about co-teaching, you know. It would be pretty easy just to kind of, you know, pull back, and we would still be well above average in terms of special ed services, you know, but we wouldn't be pushing the envelope. But, but we feel that, that need, and that, that's how it should be. Um, so, I, I, you know, and have, so to have something that's, that's so well, that not only, like, feels so good, in terms of embracing um, the culture, you know, and in the obvious juxtaposition with the insanity happening at the national level right now, um, you know, even that aside, to have the evidence and the research support this um, as as a as an approach um, is really excellent. So I'm I'm, I'm pretty psyched to vote for this tonight. Um, uh, again, I wish it was it was it was bigger. You know, <laughs> I wish we had I wish we had four classes, but. Um, I think as it goes along, if it becomes obvious that it is as much of a uh, benefit as, as we're all hoping that it will be, um, that we'll, we'll see what those opportunities are, right? We'll, we'll see if it, if it is having the impact, um, even if it isn't the primary goal on, um, on charter retention that adds to the budget that allows us to expand, where we see the, the more sustainable um, sources for staffing, which is one of the big um, impediments to, to starting off, off really large. So. Um, yeah, and I just I really want to thank all of the all the people behind the scenes who have done an incredible amount of work over uh, a long, long period of time. Okay, so it sounds like maybe the committee is moving towards getting ready for a vote. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Am I reading this right? <laughs> uh, Ms. McDonald, <coughs> is, any other comments or thoughts? No. Okay, thank you for hanging in there for uh, with us. <laughs> Um, okay, so if we're ready for a vote, this will be a roll call vote as well. Um, so we'll start from Mr. Nakajima. Nakajima, aye. Ordonez, aye. Spitzer, aye. Demling, aye. McDonald, aye. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say, uh, you know, also a big thank you to Ms. Chamberlain, um, and uh, all the others who have worked on this program for such a long time. Um, I'm very excited about it. I actually do think that it will be a really positive thing for the district and for our community. Um, I think this gives us an opportunity to take a step forward in a way that many other districts don't get a chance to do. Um, and for that, I'm, I'm really grateful. Uh, I do think we have some very serious kinks to work out, uh, and I'm hopeful that we will keep this in the spotlight as we move forward. Mm -hmm. And one other comment that I just wanted to make in looking through this calendar, especially now that the vote has uh, passed, uh, the family engagement events, I'm hopeful that we can actually do a very strong promotion to yeah. push this throughout uh, the district and throughout the community so that people really understand what this is. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. And I just wanted to add something on that, because I, I asked um, what could seem like a silly question earlier about how it jazzed up everyone is. Um, and, but I'm, I'm really excited about this. But um, the reason I brought it up as well as resources is really building off of a lot of things that have just been said, particularly the, what the chair just said, is anything we can do as a committee, anything we can do collectively to keep the orientation on an organic learning, imp continuous improvement, and the core mission and the goals of this thing. Because there are going to be bumps and things that have to be worked over. And I don't want to sound funny about this, but there's an odd tendency sometimes 
um, in our society, I won't say in our town, I'll say in our society, um, to, to start picking things to death and starting to see, you know, sort of games of telephone where people think something's happening in a program and so they start thinking maybe this isn't, oh, it isn't working out or it isn't what I thought it was going to be. And I really feel like since there's going to be a lot of work to do over the next year, that's going to be a learning experience. And one set of challenges solved is going to set two new challenges that, that can be embraced and can be embraced as a really positive environment for, for that change in that building. And my point is we, we all have to collectively keep our energy focused on that positive process of embracing criticism, embracing creativity, not shrinking from challenges that we see, but keeping positive about it. And then, as you said, thanking people when they're doing wonderful work. Thank you. Yeah. OK, so moving us along, the next item on the agenda is a Wildwood and Crocker Farm identity work update. And I want to thank uh, those members of the community that are here. We've been waiting patiently for us to get through the previous topics. Uh, Dr. Morris, I'm assuming you have um, Yep. So I'm actually going to turn this over to Mr. Shea and then Mr. Yaffe and Ms. Estes, who are going to update uh, the committee and the community on the work at each of their schools. We most recently had uh, the groups get together on Friday afternoon, so there's some fresh updates. Um, but I'm not sure who would like to start. I'll leave it up to Mr. Shea. It seems yes. like it's going to start. I don't know if this is a... <laughs> we should be following that rather lengthy discussion. That stuff's pretty... Slim, it's but especially really important. To you follow yeah, I know. So thank you for coming. Um, thank you. Uh, can I just say a few things about what I heard, or that are connected to Crocker Farm? So, um, I was just thinking when I was sitting over there. I was just thinking that one thing we got to make sure that we don't get lost in the shuffle here, right? You know, I just spent like a, you guys all spent an hour there really talking about a whole new program at another school, and I'm sitting there going, all right. We really got to get our skates on, um, <laughs> but I think we've had our skates on for a while, so I, I'm, I'm not that worried. Um, the thing I, w I just also want to remind people is that um, uh, our school, uh, Crocker Farm School, is a very diverse school as it is. Um, it, next time you get a chance, if you're driving by or you, you, you want to uh, come into the building, um, every year we do our open house, uh, and we, when we do our open house, uh, all the kids come with their parents. This year, I think we'd probably be between 83 and 85% of the families came to the, the night. And what we do is we take everyone's picture and we put it up on the wall. And we sort of build a sort of collage or a photograph of who we are at Crocker Farm. And it's worth looking at because when you walk in, and it's actually not a bad um, thing to do if, if you are in the business of trying to um, have a private school where you make money, I think people come in and they look at it and they immediately say, I want to be part of it. Um, so no matter what we build, say even at Fort River, Crocker Farm's still going to be this incredibly diverse, vibrant, strong place with lots of different ideas and knowledge and viewpoints and, and history. And, and so, for example, 25% of Crocker Farm families are uh, of Latino heritage. It's not going to be 2% when Fort River moves. It's still going to be probably about 20%. So I think let's all remember that um, and, and keep that right in the... And i got to remember that, and our, our, our people have to remember that. <coughs> The last thing I just want to say before I even say two words on what we're doing is that uh, I know we keep, I, for years I've been around, I keep talking about, you know, people leaving and people, you know, going to other places. And, and so I, I, I get stressed when I hear that because um, we get the opposite problem. So we get 59 kindergartners right now at Crocker Farm. 59, right? Five of them are school choice. 54 are kids who live in the Crocker Farm district. So that's a good number. We feel pretty good about that. So we're not that worried about us not having enough kids. We're actually worried about having too many kids and not enough room for all the kids that want to come to our school. So I say that just because I want to keep thinking about, as we're thinking about identity, right, is that we're not thinking about identity because we're having a problem and because we're, like, in, in need of something. You know, we're actually in, in the business, I think, of trying to capture a little bit about what we've been doing well, maybe try and get better at some things that we're not doing so well and, 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 and move from there. So I, I think um, we feel pretty positive getting into this work that we're about to do. And, and, it, and I think it says identity or theme work. And really, in essence, it's about building a, a, a school improvement plan that is, that's meaningful and, and, and something that people can um, latch onto and, and not be a piece of paper that we just 
bring here to the school committee and say, please stamp and please make OK. We want to build something that, you know, has, has, has teeth and helps us continue to have... I don't think Michael let us keep having 59 kindergartners because we want the space, but we want to take everyone who wants to come to our building. Um, so with all that said, I'll just say a couple of quick things. One is that, um, just in terms of the process, so um, a small number of our teachers and a small number of family uh, members from Crocker Farm, from about five parents, six or seven teachers met over the summer for two days with Dr. Rodriguez, who you're all familiar with, who helped do the uh, enrollment work. And we spent two days just really sort of grappling with some of the material about how to um, tackle this school improvement uh, plan, your work with some identity work. In the second day of that work, we started to look at um, sort of trying to draft a, a vision about who we, who we, want, to, who we want to be. So, so that was in the summer. Um, sus subsequent to that, our um, teachers have used perhaps up to four, maybe three or four staff meetings over the last couple of months, um, sort of looking at... Um, just a, a draft of, of, of the vision. Um, sort of, we've also done some protocols and a little bit of sort of um, research into sort of um, where people feel strong in their practice, where people would like to improve, um, and, and, and doing a little bit of thinking about how that impacts us, you know, individually and collectively. So we've done that as, as in staff meeting time um, last Friday. Uh, we have a group of uh, teachers who are a school leadership group, probably about nine or ten teachers and paraprofessionals. And then we have about eight or nine parents on our school governance council. Five of them were able to come last Friday with uh, eight or nine of our teachers to a meeting with Dr. Uh, Rodriguez in the afternoon, Nick, right? Yes. 12 to 3. And so on Friday, we spent a little bit of time again um, uh, just looking at our, our vision, sort of tearing apart that again a little bit, looking at starting to dig into some of our core values that we would like to sort of uh, investigate, thinking about next steps in terms of how to get larger groups of parents involved. Uh, our SGC group has got some good ideas starting this Thursday, our, our math night. Uh, come along if you want to, if you want to see it. Um, try to um, get a little bit more uh, feeling from them in terms of what they see with our draft of our vision and our, our core values. A couple of our teachers in the SILT group have taken on the task of um, surveying uh, students in the, in the, in the school. Um, we shall convene again sometime in December, December 5th, to start to think about uh, next steps in terms of really diving into sort of greater detail of the work. So I think, in essence, we've got working groups working together, starting to bond, try and get as many uh, voices from the community as possible. And the goal, I think, is at some point in June for us to come here. Um, I think, and Nick might be able to say this with greater clarity than I can, I, I think that this identity theme stuff will emerge as we, as we talk and as we, as we meet together. Um, I think I, I, uh, I speak with many families at Crocker Farm, whether it be in the morning at the bus or, and, and people um, I think are generally quite happy to come to Crocker Farm. What's not always so easy is to, um, express why right and so we're really um we have gut feelings that it's a nice safe place it's, it's warm it's welcoming it's got really strong teachers um we have a really nice sense of community um but we've got to dig a little deeper and, and, and see what that's all about and, and we'll do so and and hopefully over the course of the next few months come back to you with some um specifics uh hopefully that's helpful ish um my veteran colleague, Mr. Yeffe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll say hi, I'll say hello. How's it going? Um, he's like to follow up there. <laughs> Share the mic, too. So, you all know Allison? Allison Estes? Thank you for being here. Yeah, so. Um, Take a breath. Um, following up Derek is, is always a wonderful thing because he gets me excited you know, about the work that we're doing and, and passionate. He feels so passionately and, and uh, Diane's here too. So I, I feel like, um, so I'm going to, I told Alice I'm just going to give a little bit of a historical background. I feel like all this work really started eight years ago, nine years ago when the school was redistricted. Yeah. And we all became interested in forming a community at each of our schools. So we're building on that. So I like, I don't see this as anything new, but I do feel like this is the right time to do this to go deeper into the work that we've all been doing. So Fort River is doing the dual language 
as Diane's already said quite often, is you know they'll continue doing the work in terms of best practices. Uh, at Wildwood, it started like at the other two schools too, with really looking at student engagement and how we could get kids excited about learning and and be active participants, and that led into. Uh, conversations about students owning their own learning, student-led assessments, and from there thinking about what learning is um, and how you go deeper and create these deeper experiences for students. And that's how we got to, uh, at each of the schools, exploring project-based learning. Um, at the same time, building a culture and character uh, and community. So that's where we're at. And as Derek says, it's going, where the identity is going to go, we're not quite sure, you know, because we want it to be an open process. So it started um, at the open house where, uh, and this is an example of how ideas feed off each other. I had gone down to Derek's open house that he was talking about two years in a row, and it just knocked my socks off. It was so exciting. Um, so Allison and I went back to the staff, and staff weren't sure. But everybody jumped in this year, and, and like Derek's saying, that students were leaving the open house, and that led to engagement. So that's an example of how the ideas are being shared in the elementary school. Um, and now, Allison's, we've been part of this, what Derek's talking about with, the, uh, with uh, Dr. Rodriguez. At the open house, we started to uh, get surveys from families and kids about what they want Wildwood to become. And now that's online, so uh, families can answer online. Um, and we're going to be asking staff these kind of questions tomorrow afternoon. You know, what do you want Wildwood to be in five years from now? How do you, what type of school would be great, a great place for kids and for families and for staff? So I've done enough talking. So, Allison, go ahead. How do you want to? No, that's exactly what we have been working towards. Um, I think that one of the things that I will add is the work that the school has done over the past is definitely being carried through so that the staff feels a sense of connection, so that the work that has been done doesn't feel like it's being dropped. We are not starting from scratch. We are using that as a good foundation and base in order to create a a sense of continuity and a sense of culture that has a history to it. So um, I'm excited. I'm new to the community. So for me, this feels like I'm getting a chance to learn all of that. And um, I think, what, what did you say, like 30% of the staff has is new? No, actually it's a, it turned out to be bigger. Oh, four, in the last, so we created uh, a vision uh, six years ago, and uh, we conducted a similar process. I think we're, we're go, definitely going to improve on it and have it be more reflective. But since that time, in 2013, 43% uh, of the professional staff is new. Yeah, so and this if is... if you added para-educators, it's over 50%. Mm. Wow. So this is giving us all such a great opportunity to connect to the history of the work that has been done and then to really create that excitement around student engagement and student leadership in learning, which is not always what we as educators got into the profession to do. You know, when I first started teaching, I would not have thought of student-centered learning as the way that this would go 20 years ago. But mm -hmm. this is where we are, and we have to start reimagining how classrooms are run. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited about that future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, to add on to that, you know, tomorrow's election day, and so I, I feel like what we're really doing is preparing students to be citizens in the 21st century. And so I actually dug up the mission statement from the Amherst Public Schools, and it was pretty inspiring. You know, the thing that stands out is like contributing members of a multi ethnic, multicultural, pluralistic society. So if that's our mission, as in all the schools, like, okay, how do we, create, how do, we do that? How do we make that happen? So I feel like the dual language program is pretty bold. At Crocker Farm and, and Wildwood, we want to be bold too. Um, and Fort River, <laughs> but you know. So what would that? What? And I do feel like uh, with your support and blessings and Mike's and Doreen's, we could do that. Mm -hmm. There's nothing really holding us back, except our own uh, sense of limitation of what we can do, and whether it goes, you know, the directions we've already started to go into in terms of integrating the arts, project-based learning, 
uh, outdoor education, gardening. These are things that people in Amherst are, going to, are already super excited about. And we, we really, at this point, I'd love to have us dive in and say, yeah, let's embrace this. Let's reimagine our schools for our children. Uh, the families will support it. The kids will get excited. The teachers, um, they need time to plan mm. and to do this well. Yes. That's, that's the main thing. Um, because it's, it's going to take time to plan these, these kind of curriculum experiences. So. That. Yeah. So here we are. We're, <laughs> to do it and we're looking forward to the work. Well, thank you very much for all of you for, for coming tonight. We really appreciate that. And I think that this conversation had actually started because we recognize that all of our schools uh, contribute so much to the fabric of this community and to the district. And, you know, we didn't want to leave that behind, right, in conversations around Fort River. We wanted to make sure that it was being very clear, made very clear to the community that Wildwood and Crocker Farm are also very well loved and extremely vital to the health and well-being of our, of our district. And so we're looking forward to that. One thing that I did want to mention, um, and then I'll look to the committee to see if there's any other comments, is um, it's great to hear that you'll be looking maybe to present something in June. Uh, and I'm wondering if it would be possible maybe to get some kind of uh, indication a little earlier than that uh, just it helps I think in our conversations right and this is what we've talked about as a committee in our conversations around what's you know the dual language program and how we're thinking about uh, our budget priorities and our goals and all of that for the superintendent in the next year it's really helpful to hear from our other schools you know kind of the direction that you're headed in just to, to get that big picture in mind so you know, perhaps maybe the spring at some point um, to have hmm. you come back and, you know, and, and make uh, just a little progress, you know, report to us would be really helpful as we're doing that. Mr. Dunley? Yeah, I was, I was going to say something similar that <coughs> you talked about, like, uh, what Fort River is doing is bold and you want to be bold too, like, and, and I, I completely hear that and, and, like, I hear and feel, like, the passion and excitement. I think if, if um, it kind of, where the rubber hits the road is, like, the schedule of implementation, so, like, Fort River is thinking about, well, we just voted on it, actually, is now planning on doing the bold uh, next fall, right? So, June is a little late to be coming back and saying, hey, we have this bold idea for completely transforming the way we do, or restructuring, you know, whatever the vision becomes, right? Um, so, I would totally leave it up to, you know, you and, and the groups that you're working with, and the, the parents and the, the staff engagement that you, uh, you described and that Derek described, I, I think sounds really great. Um, to, to determine what, what that schedule is, you know, maybe it, maybe the vision crystallizes, but it's a it's a phase one yeah. for yeah. next year, and then it becomes uh -huh. something more fully manifested the following year. Um, you know, maybe there's pieces, um, but I think um, I think the thing that gets, well, at least the thing that gets me excited, but I think the thing that gets a lot of the community excited too is is having those like sort of sp specific examples. Like you, you you mentioned a few of them, you know, the project based learning, integrated arts, outdoor learning. These are like specific things that that are like concrete, right? Because visions can be like all sort of up here. But when parents, you know, hear something, you know, when they hear a, a, a passionate gardener talking about outdoor learning and, and what that means, you know, and how that can integrate to student-led things, that can be really exciting. Um, so I think, I think that's the kind of thing that would be awesome to, to hear. Dr. Morris? Yeah, so, so on a couple of those points, I think uh, one thing was the expectation for them was to have a multi-year plan that comes in the spring. So I think to your point, it wouldn't be like just for the next school year. And I think a progress update is certainly reasonable in spring time. Um, I also think in terms of the boldness uh, discussion <laughs> um, that, you know, one of the unique aspects, I just, I think it's worth stating that one of the unique aspects of dual language is it happens one grade a year over seven years. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's an unusual situation where change structurally can, uh, st structurally is a gradual change. Um, and it's gradual in a different way than it can be in most change scenarios where it's more holistic across seven grade levels, but it, it, the change itself is gradual. I think dual language program this is my vantage point, no one else's, but um, is sort of a significant change one grade level at a time. So I do think just framing those is not one's better than the other, but in terms of pace and boldness, um, I just want to <laughs> just say that they're, they're sort of, distinct and, and making analogous 
comments. I mean, I think we have to, but I just would, uh, not the committee, but just think through how the change looks a little different given that those different scenarios. We wouldn't imagine a change that wasn't to a language that at Wildwood or Clark Farm starts in kindergarten and doesn't affect sixth grade because the structure, the basic structures of school remain the same. Um, so I think the gradual nature of seven grade levels versus the gradual nature of how change can functionally work, giving teachers time to make those changes, it just operates functionally a little different. So I just had a couple couple comments. I mean, one, obviously, I appreciate your coming and, and sharing your thoughts. Particularly, um, it felt it felt real and granular to what you're doing right now. I felt like you opened up your calendar and opened up your your month and shared with us what you've been doing the last few months. Um, I know that on the committee over the last four or five months, uh, every single committee member at one point or another has raised the question of, hey, by the way, um, how are things going at Crocker and Wildwood? Um, we want to hear more about it. Uh, we want to know that there's continuing progress. We care about this. Uh, it's important for multiple reasons. And so um, what's funny is that uh, Principal Shea started out with, with two simultaneous comments, one seemingly under his breath, that he doesn't <laughs> want uh, uh, these not, the non-Fort River schools in the district um, to get lost in the shuffle um, somehow, which, which I think, the, at least from the committee's perspective, there's been a real <coughs> persistent commitment to not do that. Um, but then a really interesting observation that your organic identity of who you are as a community, who you are with your educational mission, uh, is complex and unique and doesn't lend itself necessarily structurally to um, a particular moniker. The interesting thing about doing, and it sort of, play, I guess I'm playing off of what you're saying, mm -hmm. the, they, a little differently, that, um, so I, I'm so excited about the dual language program. But the funny thing, the challenge for you is that if you have a dual language <coughs> program, it is actually conceptually fairly easy, even if it's really complex to do, it's actually really easy to explain to someone what it is. And it's actually pretty easy to explain how that connects to broader social, cultural, and educational goals that you have and how it fits with the mission of the district. And so, and then the fact that you're implementing it one year at a time per grade means you even have sort of like, I mean, even if, again, it's really hard to do. But my point is you can, you can create a chart with boxes on it where you're like, oh, so this box moves to that box and that moves box to that box and it all builds to this thing. <clears throat> cool, right? And, and so what, what, I, what I liked about what the superintendent just said a moment ago, and I think it echoes not only what you were saying, but interestingly enough, if you were here at the beginning of the meeting where there was this discussion and presentation about um, special uh, needs services and programming in the district. And what was interesting is it was started off with this really, really intensive um, a uh, broader conversation through enrollment working group, and then an intensive one that was very more professionally driven, but also included parents, and a learning process of discovering what we're, how to, in fact, meet the best mission we have for parents and students and our community, professional community. And it ended up in a different place than it began, and it was um, a really rich and expansive process in which there was really good learning out of it. And so to me, when I look at what you're doing now, I think of it in that same way. That even if, as Mr. Demling said, one hopes some things fall out uh, of this process that allow you to toggle between the specific and the granular of things you can do and a more coherent mission as you're, that you could describe to people around what you're doing, that taking the time to do that in an organic way, which speaks to my point earlier about the special ed uh, uh, group that was presenting at the beginning of the meeting is extraordinarily valuable, innately valuable, and um, it undoubtedly will improve your ability not only to execute what you're already doing, it's very special, but also to communicate it to, to stakeholders who care deeply about it. That was long. I'm sorry. That was long. But I felt like you deserved the level of thought I was trying to give it. Anyway. Sorry. I just, I think, um, having... I just want to say two quick things. That um, So the Fort River, Crocker Farm, Wildwood piece. Many of the things that are happening right now at Fort River 
are happening at Crocker Farm and are happening at Wildwood. And many of the things I think that will happen at Fort River next year will be happening at Crocker Farm and happening at Wildwood. And so as much as we've got this, you know, established you voted tonight, we, we continue sort of beneath the, the, the title are going to have these multitude of things. So, so as Mr. Demley was saying a minute ago, um, so let's take, for example, uh, restorative practices and, and mindfulness even, right? We all, in our own way, are sort of practicing some of these sort of conceptual ideas with all of the students and we're trying to find time to be able to allow teachers to have the enough experience to be able to feel comfortable to, to do this type of work, right? You know, kids get in an argument, right? So, so what happened? Who was harmed? How are we going to make it better? How does that sort of fit into your classroom setup? And, and so I think we have a lot of things that are going to stay in common. Um, our teachers need, uh, continually need time to be able to um, develop all the, 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 the time to be able to practice the, the, these skills. Uh, um, and, and so what we've done in the last bunch of years almost is we've done too many things. And so I think what we're hoping to try and do is try and reduce how many things we're doing so that we can focus our identity and our strength rather than keep adding, if that makes sense, right? Um, I'd like to make a motion for a two-minute break, or five minutes, however. Five minutes? Second. Uh, all those in favor, roll call vote, please. Nagajina, aye. Ordonez, aye. Spitzer, aye. Demling, aye. McDonald, aye. Thank you. We'll take a five-minute break. Um, so, calling the meeting of the Amherst School Committee back to order at uh, 8.41. Thank you very much for the recess. And the next item on the agenda is the uh, Port River Feasibility Study discussion. Um, and if committee members will remember last meeting that we had, we had a conversation around uh, the work of the Feasibility Study Building Committee and then um, some of the questions that have been coming up among the community and among the school committee uh, regarding the work of the committee. And so we thought it would be a great opportunity to first sit down with uh, Mr. Jonathan Salvin, who's the chair of that committee, uh, as well as Mr. Nakajima, who's the, the school committee representative to that committee, and Dr. Morris, uh, and have a conversation about ways that we might improve that process and maybe get some clarity on some outstanding issues, uh, and then think about constructively ways that we might, you know, moving forward, how we might improve uh, our communication, joint communication to the community and, and all that. And so Mr. Salvin agreed uh, to come to the next meeting of, of the Amherst School Committee so that he could give a brief presentation on the work that's been done so far and some of the outstanding questions. Uh, and then, uh, again, just invite the committee to participate in, in some problem solving and some thinking through. So, sure. uh, Dr. Morris, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add or Mr. Nakajima? Nope. Uh, okay. I think the only thing I'll add is just appreciate Mr. Salvin's um, leadership of that committee and um, just to I think the enhanced communication that's occurred over the last couple of weeks, um, I think will will pay dividends down the road. Great. Okay, Mr. Seven, thank you. So hopefully this is picking me up enough. Um, so I figured I'd, I'd start with a little bit of background where, where we've been, um, a little bit of how we came into being, and then I can talk about what we're working on today and we can talk a little bit about the future. Um, so as some people may know and other people may not, um, the first idea for this committee, uh, really not really idea, the committee was authorized by town meeting back in March of 2017. Um, and the school committee kind of gave us our framework just over a year ago. I think it was the 17th of October of last year. Um, and we are a feasibility study committee, which means there isn't going to be a building that comes out of our work. What we're going to produce is a, a study working with a design team. Um, that presents options to you. Um, and this feasibility study is focused on Fort River School and the site. So we're, we're that, that's kind of our charge, is that, that, that one site. Um, and part of our charge, I think both from the school committee and from town meeting, um, is that we study multiple options. Mm -hmm. And so we've kind of taken even though we're not an MSBA process, we've kind of taken the, the, the broad uh, look that MSBA would want um, and a level of options is kind of our guide. And I'll talk a little bit more of that, about that as, we, as I get through my notes. Um, 
so what have we done to date? Um, one of the things was to kind of gather information. Um, so we had uh, some air quality testing done this spring. And I think it was June or July. Actually, July isn't really spring. <laughs> um, earlier in the year. Uh, right now, uh, a survey is being uh, put together based upon both field work and and um, and includes things like wetlands flagging. So that's another piece of information that we will have that comes out of this process. That you know that plus the air quality testing. Hopefully, that has, is stuff that lives beyond the tenure of our our committee. Um, also in that category are geotechnical borings. A certain number of them were done back in the 70s, I would say, when the school was built. Um, but we've solicited for more. Um, we don't have, or at least I don't know today, standing here, what the what the the uh, current standing of that that solicitation is. Um, and one of the biggest things we've done is we hired a design team to help us sort through what can we do with this site. And so we put out a solicitation. We ultimately hired TSKB Studio. Uh, they're located in Hartford. And we've been working actively with them, I want to say, since about the middle of August. Um, and that sounds like a long time, but in, in the life of you know, a committee, it's, it's, it's actually not that long, as you probably know. Um, let's see. Jonathan, yep. I had something and just about, about the, uh, the designers. One of the things that was attractive about them, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think I am, is that they had experience um, with successfully uh, renovating existing structures. They had um, ex experience successfully building new schools. Yep. And they'd also had, um, uh, did they do, do any zero energy buildings or just darn close? <laughs> they, had, they had done some things that were, were darn close, and, and their, their team also included... Um, a specialist in in this that yeah. has has done it. That was my recollection. Um, so we there's expertise that has done it. The firm itself has done highly energy efficient and environmentally sustainable elementary school buildings. So the point is they're exp they were chosen because they actually ticked the same kind of yep. boxes that corresponded with the charge and the deliverables that Jonathan was just describing. One of the other intriguing things is they have uh, tackled an open classroom building before. Um, uh, and so that, you know, that was certainly wasn't a deciding factor, but it was an interesting point in their resume as well. It's a building type they've, they've seen and, and mm -hmm. had to successfully deal with before. Um, was there anything else? No, no. Okay. Uh, let's see where we were here. Uh, one of the first things they did was obviously come out and visit the school. They came out and visited with their um, consultant team. So they, they brought mechanical engineers, structural engineers, electrical engineers, uh, a broad variety of folks through the school to see the condition. Um, they've also visited some of the other schools in the district just to, to get a comparative understanding. Um, they have met with uh, department staff, um, both with Mike and other folks in the, in the kind of the central office, but also with staff at the school, um, Diane, well, many of the teachers there to just kind of get basic understanding of both about program needs and about how the school works. Um, let's see. Uh, I've kind of jumped around a little bit. I just want to make sure I don't, don't miss anything. Um, and so part of that meeting with staff was to develop a program uh, that, the, that the, the options that they're going to explore are going to be based on. Um, so one of the, there were, were, there were many things <laughs> that we kind of had to kind of sort through about what should be kind of in and out of that program. Some of them are very basic and some of them could be based on kind of MSBA guidelines. But other things like the population, we had to sit and kind of talk about a little bit. So I'll, I'll explain some of, the, some of the things, the thoughts we've had and some of the direction we've given the committee. Um, one of which you already know about was pre-K. Uh, pre um, the, uh, the other big thing was we assumed three uh, sections per grade, which kind of aligns with the vote you just took on dual language, because today, with the exception of the occasional um, class, most of the grades are two sections. Bless you. Um, this results, uh, oops, before I go on to what it results in the population, um, it also assumes that both aims and building blocks continue to stay at Four River. 
um, and that for the time being, since we don't know what's happening, uh, you know, in, in the future, the sixth grade also stays. And that um, results in a, in a population for the purposes of this feasibility study of 420 kids. The current population, just for, for a little bit of context, is uh, 315. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so with those visits, with a discussion about the program, um, they were at a point where they could begin to explore options. And we've looked at, you know, a series of iterations, uh, and, but they, they broadly fall into about six um, broad options. Um, and they, they go from a range of an all-new school to a renovation and addition. And you know, does the addition go on this side? Does it go on this side? There, there's a, a bit of variety. Um, and I think at some point, hopefully soon, we'll have a, a joint meeting and we can kind of walk through those a little more in detail. It's very hard to describe them without, especially for me, <laughs> since professionally I'm an architect, I, I like to have drawings up when I talk about buildings. It's very, very unnerving in some ways. Um, <laughs> But so, so we, we've had this preliminary look. Um, we've, we've looked and uh, at our last meeting kind of voted on a, a program that relates to, to, to the options. Um, and now they're going off to a preliminary round of cost estimating to assign some general early value to what these options could be. Um, again, we're not going to build from any of these per se, but it, put it, it puts things in a context, Eric. Jonathan, and um, if I remember correctly, as you described the approximately six variations, within that, all the variations also included, or the principal number, there were three variations that included, um, like 1A and 1B or something like that. Yeah, and that would mean, that would made mean a note of that. An option that included a preschool as part of the program, and then another uh, design or estimate that would not include a preschool. Right. So that, um, at least as a preliminary matter, uh, it can be refined later based on public input, school committee, others, right. but that, that the, a deliverable out of this work would include both information around um, what the feasibility range of costs and pluses and minuses are, building options on that site that include putting in a preschool and do not and with the different variations of from everything from a totally new school to um, trying to recondition the building as is with whatever additions. Right. So of those six, they they are doing that exploration for five. The one they're not is is a, a very basic kind of spruce it up model, of, for lack of a better term, um, one that that it didn't really make sense necessarily to add that that piece in on. Um, and again, all of these options uh, are going to are intended to meet the same basic criteria um, that probably generally everybody in town has concerns about, not just with Fort River, but with 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 Wildwood as well. Um, things like natural light being accessible to all students in all the classrooms, good you know good air quality, good ventilation, good acoustics, um, you know eliminating the problematic open classroom design. Um, compliance, depending on the, again, where we are in that broad spectrum of options, the net zero bylaw that the town has passed. And then, you know, also having flexibility for the future, we're standing here now, and it's a feasibility uh, study, and the building's not gonna be built from this, but we wanna make sure that the plan has some reasonable flexibility about what one might be able to do in the future. Uh, I think I already noted that uh, it's gone off to an initial round of um, pricing, budgeting. Um, we're expecting the architects to have that back on the 21st, which I can't remember if we're meeting. I think that's the day before Thanksgiving and we're not. Mm -hmm. And so we need to probably schedule another meeting with our group to look at that, that information. Um, not done yet. or. A whole host of things, really. Um, this is an initial round. We would like to and intend to and very much want to engage in some level of community outreach. Um, we 
we have discussed it preliminarily as a committee. We're meeting Wednesday. It's going to be a, a topic we're going to talk about in the committee uh, this Wednesday. Eric? No, no, I was going to say, and it's not, obviously, it's not a matter of if to do it. It's a matter of how to do it. Right. And so if you, if you dial back three weeks ago or so, there was the concept of doing a, a, some sort of joint meeting or meeting with the school, our committee, right. the school committee here, and then following on from that with doing a series of, of meetings with the public. Um, and at least, I mean, I, I know this is an, up for discussion, but I'm just helping the committee understand that the discussion was at least involved enough to say that we would try to meet with Fort River PGO, um, the public, public at different times of the day. Right. There was there was a notion of having that kind of rich right. Some engagement. Something, something sort of big, big public meeting, but also being able to do smaller things to, to try to reach out to people when, when they're available. Right, and it, that had been conceptually thought of being done in the, in, in the early December time frame prior to when people sort of go off calendar toward the end of the month. But also right. in that, but man, I'm sure that's going to be somewhat in flux. I, I think so. I think we need to talk uh, on Wednesday about when we're going to get the number because that, that's a piece that's part of the context of talking about a project. Um, but the but that's generally the, the schedule we've been aiming for. So. And, and just to jump in here, too, I mean, I think <clears throat> when you mentioned the 21st um, as a possible date for, you know, the cost estimate, the first draft of the cost estimation to come through, mm -hmm. we are meeting on the 27th, this committee is. And so even thinking about those timelines, it'd be great to create some sort of system, right, where we can, you know, share information. Yep. More or less seamlessly, and, and because it's so difficult to schedule these meetings, uh, they are public meetings. There's you know multiple people involved, especially for your committee. It sounds like there's a lot of people involved, so it's even more than, than ours. Uh, but we have to post these meetings. There's a, there's a big procedural piece of this that, that has to be taken into right. consideration every single time. We can't just you know have a meeting. So I just want to make sure that we're thinking about that too. Um, if there are opportunities for us to try to time these meetings in a way that we can get some information from you, you know, as soon as or s relatively s soon after those big things come in, yep. that that's helpful. Mm -hmm. And then also just to point out that we had talked about maybe having the designers come for... I, that, that, that is clearly something that they're thinking ahead to. Yeah. Um, and I think they're actually, uh, before I had to leave <laughs> work, uh, I had an email from them, and I think they were going to have some thoughts about um, the nature of their presentation that they would be bring to that. Um, hopefully, it's on the, the 27th, or if we have to you know, make sure that. Well, yeah, we'll figure we'll figure out the exact timing. If, if well, we let, let's figure that delay. out. I think because we had we were a little concerned. I think when we met about the 27th, maybe not being a perfect fit for the designers to come, but you know we can we can talk a little bit more about that. I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. That's all right. Go ahead. I, I'm, I'm I'm fairly close to the end. You know, I mean, that, that public outreach is a big piece. Um, then there there has to be a, a period of kind of um, taking all that you hear and, as appropriate, working it back into the options. Um, obviously, if, if we were not a feasibility study, you would start to narrow those options down. We don't really have the requirement to do that, but we do want to take that feedback we get and improve the options that we have um, as much as we can. Um, and then we've discussed as a committee, I don't know, uh, you know, we haven't discussed this a lot, but this another public outreach at some point if we felt we needed it. Um, and then we would basically ask the designers at that point to then kind of finish up a study that we could then present to you. Eric? Yeah, I was going to say, I, mean, what I think one of the things that... Um, when when you when one frames this appropriately as a feasibility committee that comes back with a report with multiple options, then one of the things that it's it's going to be an interesting challenge to do publicly, but we need to, is say to folks that the questions that we're looking for responses from them, butchering grammar, the, point is, the, the, the feedback we're looking for from the public isn't even necessarily going to be I like this and not that. Um, it's actually more like what would I want to know or when you're giving us this report and presenting the information, what kinds of things do I want to make sure are included? Because right. um, in a lot of our conversations with the designers, they'll say that they're looking, they've looked through the engineering, they've looked through the, the structural assessment, 
they they're think they they themselves have thoughts around uh, the process, the the feasibility of different options, or the desirability of different options from a very practical, functional level. Of if you were to do this, what would it mean for how you'd build on the site? How you'd build with an incumbent school population that's existing right now? What are the costs associated with that? What's the scheduling associated with that? Not that that has to be the be-all and end-all, but the point is um, different the members of the committee, the, the school district, and the public may have different questions they would have for the designers around how this report ends up getting framed out and delivered or what questions they want to make sure are answered. Mm -hmm. That's a different than a different question you'd normally ask. If you're actually going to build a building, you desperately want to know, you know, we need to save a million bucks. <laughs> what, what, can, what, you know, what are your rank priorities of things we can include or not include? Um, in this case, I, as we were discussing in our last meeting, uh, I'm speaking from my own bias on the committee. I don't even think that's a question we should be asking necessarily. I mean, if you have a school building and it has the basic things that the school building should have and that our district needs, like mm -hmm. building blocks and aims, um, the real question for us is are we answering the questions you need to have a report that's useful to you. My point, my, I'm saying that not just as a statement, what I'm saying is other people when they're looking at this process, I would love it if they looked at it that same way and said, oh, you left this thing out of the presentation, I thought you were looking at that, can you include it? Right. And I, and I think just to, to jump on that too, the, um, you know, with community engagement, it's, it's tricky, right? Because I think we want to hear, uh, we want to have an opportunity to answer questions from the community about, you know, this process and what the end deliverable is and any other questions that they might have. They're not sitting in, the, in those meetings, the feasibility committee meetings or even these meetings to understand, you know, exactly what we're coming up with. They've sort of gotten highlights here and there from, you know, various forms of communication that we've used mm -hmm. before, but it's helpful, I think, to, to be able to have a forum or have a couple of opportunities where there's that concentration and that agenda topic, and that's what it is. Um, but I am a little concerned about, you know, setting up a, a meeting for feedback, because at that point, then it feels like we are potentially considering, you know, an option or, you know, a couple of options for actual building, or at least that might be the perception. And as soon as you start asking people for, well, what would you like to have in this building? And they give you their opinion. There's an expectation there that, that that's potentially going to end up in a project, right? And we don't have a project right now. And so, you know, my concern is to make sure that we're managing expectations of the community appropriately at all mm -hmm. committee levels so that they, no one walks away from this thinking this is a project that we're moving forward, right? Because even if we were to say tomorrow, uh, you know, we get some feedback from the community, it's a great, those are great ideas that come back to us and we, we cost something out based on those ideas. The cost will be very different in the future. The decisions that, that get made in the future may or may not match with those ideas. And, you know, based on budget, based on, you know, changes in program, a whole host of different things, right? So I guess it's just really, a, I think, a thought for all of us as we are thinking about agendas and how we're communicating with the public mm -hmm. about setting the right expectations for, you know, what the deliverables are so that we don't confuse people inadvertently, you know? Mr. Dunling. So, um, so we had a very similar conversation about this topic at the last CPAC meeting. So Heather Sheldon is on the Fort River School Building Committee. She's also on CPAC. And so she brought, uh, she was giving an update on the committee saying, oh, so we're, we're talking about doing public feedback and does CPAC want to get involved? And so we started talking about it. So, okay, well, well what's the end result here? Like, you know, to ask people to come out or, or to meet in a small group and to give specific people, it's asking a lot, right? And so once we described, well, the, the deliverable is a costed out uh, range of options about what's feasible to build at the site. And this is in no way tied to any future building. Um, or I'm sorry, it's, it's currently not tied to any future building. We, we hope that the deliverables that come out of this um, this this committee are, are leverageable in the future. We hope we hope that in a future MSBA process, once we get our statement of interest accepted, that we can, um, you know, uh, benefit from this work. But but we don't know, and we don't know when that's going to happen. And so once we sort of clarified that, uh, there was a lot less interest in providing public input. And so it is. I think tricky is 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 a big is like I'm so I'm agreeing with you, but I think it's that's the uh, the least. Uh, it's, it's a big understatement. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think this is the core problem 
Um, and I think it's, it's made all the more confusing by the terminology of calling it the Fort River Building Committee, which seems to be referred to a lot. Um, you know, we have, we have candidates running for office saying that they've heard that renovation is now possible. They've heard that the school committee is going to be building on Fort River. And um, I, I don't, I hate, hate to be the person that throws cold water on hopes, you know, because we all want these buildings to get there as soon as possible. Um, but it is very tricky to say, look, we want to be open, we want public feedback, but we're costing out a range of options and it's not a building. It's very hard, it's a very wonky thing. Uh, to explain to the public, and I've personally had a very difficult time in one-on-one -on -one conversations, and so I can't imagine the next level of, of difficulty in, in explaining that in like a forum. Dr. Morris. So uh, I think everyone's quite well, uh, articulating the challenges quite well. I do think uh, my experience with the designers has, they've been very clear on their role and the charge, mm -hmm. and I think Having non-staff, non-staff, non-elected officials be able to do that, I think they're going to be well positioned to to lead on that, and I think it, it keeps it a little cleaner, perhaps. Um, I think they've had the right framing from the beginning. I've been impressed with their work that way to to fully understand their role, um, and I do think, uh, not to get political, but but I think because there is a change in government happening tomorrow. Well, not the change, but there's an election tomorrow. Um, I think framing public forums, you know, I think the wording of it's going to matter because feedback, you know, is perhaps not the lead noun, uh, but I think informing the public is critically important because if we think of the goals of the feasibility yeah. study, um, that is one of the goals. So it's great for the committee, myself, and, and committees, uh, the two committees to have that. It's actually more important in some ways for the larger community and then other elected officials in the town to get a sense of, um, I think someone said it well uh, recently at one meeting I was at, where we're now going to have a range of, of cost estimates of schools, you know, ranging from 400 some odd students to 600 some odd students to 700 some odd students. And that's critical information for the town to, to utilize as it plans steps forward to address the larger infrastructure challenges of the buildings. Um, so I think we can get that framing right, and I think the designers can help us with that because they've been really clear uh, all along on it as well. I, I would agree. And, and we, as a committee, as, a, as our committee, I have and really been framing it about outreach. Mm -hmm. um, there is this feedback potential element, um, and I, I don't, I understand what you're saying, and I, I, I respect that position. At the same time, people want to be able to give an opinion, and I think as long as we can frame it in a context and, and make it clear that this is a step in a larger process for the town, um, hopefully we can at least successfully, uh, you know, sidestep landmines. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, I was going to say, I, I think that, um, I think the, I think the challenge is we, we, I think, I think your comment that getting the designers in the lead on whatever these sessions are, the challenge we have as a community though, is if you, if you send, if you set something up to do public communication to people who are hopefully sitting in an audience, I'm trying to think, not use different monikers for what this session is called. Um, <laughs> and then you imply or suggest somehow in your framework that you're not going to take public feedback, then you might as well not do it at all because people are going to come and hate you just merely because you're suggesting you're not going to take feedback. Um, so you kind of have to say you're willing to do that. And in fact, welcome it. I want to hear all your ideas. And so the challenge comes back to what I said, what I, what I said at the beginning where I was trying to frame this out where I don't, I'm actually sparklingly uninterested in re reliving communications challenges over the last five weeks or eight weeks. I'm more interested in thinking out, what are we framing this out now? Mm -hmm. How do we communicate consistently now? Especially because also the ch other challenge we have, and I'm just saying this bluntly publicly, because we've talked about sort of the back and forth around how we describe this work. To me, our committee here, our committee there, uh, and, and you and any communication you're doing, have to just be extremely consistent and extremely clear about what the deliverables are. In ways that we haven't been, I agree. But the point is we have to just start being very consistent because this is enough of a political football as an issue as well as a deeply felt personal passion that we, if we chase down every rabbit hole of people rumoring about what they're hearing about this um, work um, or even about the MSBA, we're just dead, and we're chasing our own tails, to mix metaphors. I mean, we're just, we're, it's, it's never, it's not going to be useful, right? Because the reality is people can think all sorts of things about what we're doing. 
a pox on us if, we, and this is where I am kind of revisiting the last eight weeks, a pox on us if we get into a situation where our own messaging and our own consistently consistency isn't clear and isn't there. So to me, that's my focus on this. And I agree, framing out whatever those outreach sessions are is critically important. I think putting the designers in charge of that is probably a really wise idea. And then start, right. and then as I was trying to say earlier, really being clear about that, that given what the deliverable is, the feedback we're looking for is on what would make this, what, what would you like, what would you need to know out of this process for this to be a useful report to you when it's done, right? Mm -hmm. Not a building or a project, but I mean, or what do you want to see in the tot lot? But it's like, you know, what, what needs to be in the, is there something in the appendix that the designer may have and the engineers have that we just should make sure we have in the appendices because somebody's going to want to look through them? That's really it. I hate to say it, though. I mean, you're right. Maybe no one shows up to these things once they fully understand what they are. But then that's a victory because it means people fully understand what it is. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I, you know, I, I'm much more interested in having a robust conversation to help answer questions and to help people better understand what the work that's actually happening. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, yeah, people are, will make their their comments, and we always invite those comments. But I think you know we want we don't want to put get put in a situation where people feel like they've been misled in some way, sure. right? And that they you know have been told that this is one project, or it's been inferred in some way because we're inviting you know that kind of input, and then it, it's not that you know. And so my my whole goal is just to make sure that we're being very very clear. Uh, so that the community doesn't feel that way about this project, because we haven't even gotten to the part where we're going to get to a project yet, you know. And right. so I want people to feel good about that, and understand that you know all the the eyes have been dotted and t's have been crossed to the extent possible, and you know we want that back and forth. But there's a limit to, to what this is. So anyway, I think this you know um, again I think that the interest in having this conversation today and you know this presentation was really just to, to hear from you know from you Mr. Salvin um, a little bit more and then also just to think with the committee about moving forward what the best steps are for us to get that back and forth that we've been talking about you know is it is it joint uh, creation of a community forum of some kind and also maybe thinking about some joint meetings that we can schedule in advance, you know, with the designers or without the designers, maybe, you know, we can impose on you a little bit more, um, or other members of the com of the committee to come and, you know, and, and sit with us for a little while, or maybe soon just thinking about joint meetings. I think I'm just putting it all on the table because I think it's worth figuring out, you know, what makes the most sense so that we can keep this process moving smoothly and we're all more or less on the same page. Any other comments? Morris? Was that, I mean, would you like to? Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. did you want to have that conversation now? Is I guess what I mean to I say. Think, I think I, I would be interested, in, you know, we're, we're looking at the 27th potentially as being a meeting mm -hmm. where we would have the designers. But like, again, I said, you know, we didn't really um, think that might be a good idea given the timing for all these other meetings. So if that's not, maybe the 27th becomes the meeting where we sit down and actually talk about it. Um, but if folks have some ideas right now that you want to share, you know, I don't see why we can't take a couple minutes to do that. No, no. I was just going to say that since Jonathan said, I should say, by the way, I'm actually the vice chair of the committee. So one of the reasons I was jumping in to speak is since I have a formal role on that committee as well. I'm not just peanut gallerying what you were saying. I started jumping into that reason. But, um, but since you said... Since you You're said, also a full member of this committee. I know, so but, I'm, but, I think I'm, but I think, you know, I'm, you know... Uh, anyway, the uh, uh, you mentioned that the designers were going to come on Wednesday and share their thoughts on outreach, including, I think, to this committee? Yeah, well, yes, I, I think they they were specifically thinking ahead to that meeting on the 27th. Okay. Um, so I think before we think write off the notion that the designers are going to present on the 27th, is we should you should get that report. I'm not going to be here, obviously, but you should right. get that report from them. Or even tomorrow in advance. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily. I'm not suggesting we actually write it off. I, I think what, I think that, I think their idealized timeline would be for them to have been able to pre present to the Fort River Committee yeah. the costs, and I, I think the you know Fort River Committee would would like to see the product of that, um, you know, because we may have issue with it. We don't want to pass on something that <laughs> we see big flaws in. I don't, I don't think that would be the case, yeah. um, and then have be able to have that meeting. Um, 
it may be just a matter of rethinking about what we were doing on the 27th. If they're already planning to come, I, I, you know, maybe we're having a conversation that just doesn't have that numbers piece, and we have to to push that. I don't know. I, I, I just, I mean, the reason I'm saying it though is, a, they they they'll come with ideas, so there right. may be actually good ideas that would make that use productive. But also, I just think more sunshine is better than less sunshine. And so, if if there's a useful way to use that meeting on the 27th, that's driven by what the designers are working on and developing, yep. and what that what that end report starts looking like, meaning in the sense of this frame of what the feasibility study looks like, um, that's probably actually useful for this committee to get into in a greater depth, mm -hmm. but also useful to the extent people watch these things on TV. It'll it'll mean a broader community will be getting more, you know, practical understanding of what's actually being done, and then if that were followed on with another meeting with the cost estimates, that almost would be better because then you'd have a two-step of getting really into the details. Okay. Just my thought. Yep. I mean, I, I'm sure the group will want to talk about it. Sure. Dr. Morris, did you want to add something? Before? I think I was going to say very similar things to what Mr. Nakajima said, so I'll pass. Well, you're a member of the committee, too. I am. We're thinking of like minds. Ms. <laughs> Spencer? So I'm, I'm not a member of the committee, but um, <laughs> I, I, I'm curious. So during the superintendent's update, we talked about having an update on the capital plan, for lack of a, sorry, no, it's getting late, a capital plan, and um, talking about specifically, I know, some of the deferred maintenance items that have arisen as a result of the building's aging. Is that um, going to also look at, at all about long-term planning about either building or renovating additional? Like, is that going to be part of the potential presentation? Because if so, I, I feel like this is integral to that conversation. And we should think about timing those three pieces. You know, the, the, mm -hmm. we should have that capital information, too. So. so it's not looking at renovating or rebuilding in the way that the architects and designers are thinking of that. We don't have the in-house capability to do that level of work, but it okay. is looking actively at things, just because I want to get more specific to answer your question yeah, better. I appreciate that. It's actually looking at, you know, actively looking at HVAC systems. It's actively looking at generators. It's actively looking at um, furniture. It's actively looking at a lot of items. The ADA audit we won't have by November 27th, so we have, a, like, a general placeholder, which is meaningless. Mm -hmm. um, because that work won't be done till the beginning of, basically, to the new year. Um, it's, but it's looking at not just like around the edge types of things. I don't mean to be flip about it that, that, that way, but like it, it's in the past capital plans. If you look for Amherst, there's been some major items, but it's been more about maintenance. This is assuming we're going to be in these buildings for a while. How do we have a multi-year plan mm -hmm. to make them more functional than they are now? Um, so there, there's pretty significant items on there that are a little different than what you may have seen, what what, what we have presented, frankly, uh, in the past. It's not that we've let things go. I don't want to, like the district, it's well before my time. Um, but it's, it's now, I mean, I think there were years where there was, you know, a, a hoping or an assumption that we wouldn't be in the buildings that many more years. That is not the guiding assumption in the capital plan. Good. And that sounds like the way it should be and yeah. and i guess building off of that and also just kind of this evening of spending a lot of our time talking about fort river <laughs> i i think it's it's a, it is important that we think about this building feasibility in light of all of our schools and and i and i guess this is the thing that gets me frustrated in terms of the I mean, it's just a function of this work. It's like we have three buildings and we need to, but we have, you know, a whole district that we want to make sure all of our kids are in in, um, in healthy buildings and, and, you know, buildings that um, facilitate learning. And we've been hearing about the challenges and facilities, at least, uh, you know, some more minor ones, maybe in Crocker Farm, but all three of our buildings, we've been this time hearing about the challenges. So I don't know where to take this, but it, it, it does feel like if we keep... The one thing we haven't been talking about is the having this conversation in light of a larger conversation. Maybe that's too challenging. Maybe we do need to do it kind of like this bird by bird approach that um, mm. I often use for my own work. But it just it, it doesn't sit well with me. So I don't know if there's a way to find a way to integrate it into this larger conversation about the capital planning and then also about the needs of all three of our schools. So, so I'm really glad you brought that up because. Um, 
And I, I think it, it fits well into two things. One is, is this idea of being really clear about the framing when we're communicating and having forums um, for public input, um, which is, you know, our, our committee, you know, again, since the March 17 building project, right, uh, last vote, um, we haven't had 30 seconds about any discussion about would we like to build on Fort River or would we like to build on Wildwood? And, I mean, at least for me, I'm, I'm assuming for everyone, you know, we, we still want to address both buildings. And so even though we have this Fort River feasibility study, which a lot of money and attention and time is going into for good reason, um, that, that doesn't mean that, that Wildwood is no longer a concern or that we've somehow put Fort River ahead of Wildwood and now full steam ahead on Fort River, okay, and we'll figure out Wildwood. You know, so that there could be that perception if we don't sort of constantly clarify the things that we already assume, which is that's not the case. Um, to, so to your Ms. Spitzer's greater point about how do we tie all these things together, I'm thinking, and maybe this is something we have sort of have to see how it plays out, but um, I'm kind of thinking after we see the, the capital plan, and, and we see what that cost is going to be. Um, and, and coupled with the fact of the, that our uh, Amherst town manager recently has stated that, you know, sure you can do anything, but he does not see a, a fiscal way in which the town self-funds a new building. Um, and then you add that onto MSBA timelines, you can start to put pieces together in terms of what's possible and feasible. Um, I don't want to get that part too much more ahead of the horse, <laughs> but I think I think we could have potentially a larger conversation of okay once the Fort River Feasibility Committee uh, work is is done and once we we're looking at that capital plan we know what that is, then we can sort of tie together those those themes. That's that's my current sense. Mr. Nakajima. Yeah, I mean I, this is something um, uh, I guess offline as much as on, on in the meetings. I've been bringing up the last probably four or five weeks that I feel like a lot of these things are tied together, but more importantly, in terms of public understanding about what we're trying to do and also what we're kind of facing, um, they're definitely tied together, right? So, I mean, uh, to be blunt, we had dirty buildings that had like rat infestations, mouse infestations this fall. It was disgusting. We needed to clean them up, so we focus on cleaning them up. We have building system issues, some current and some projected in the near term, that have to be addressed to keep these buildings functional and not just functional, but you know, good and as good an environment as they can be um, for working in and uh, learning. And then we have this longer range issue, which is is complex um, around uh, substantially revise, re renovating or replacing these facilities, right? And the reality is, all three levels of work. Um, are going on simultaneously to whatever extent they're dormant or not dormant. All of them need to go on. And I think more importantly, given the salience of the, these issues from trash cleanup straight through new facilities, they're, they're all so salient. There are things that are on everyone's mind in, the commu in our community collectively that we need to frame out how we're approaching each level of decision what we can be saying we're doing now. I mean, this is why, as Mr. Dembling, you know, darn well knows, if, if the MSBA took in Wildwood again, then we'd start talking about Wildwood again. Um, it's not, you know, you know what I mean? It's like it isn't actually neglect that we're not talking about a new facility or not a new facility on that land. There's really good practical reasons why it's not currently a hot topic of, of active planning, even though it's something we all might desire to do as soon as we can. I know you know this, I'm just saying it out loud. And so my, and so what I would, I mean, I'm happy to defer to the chair, vice chair and superintendent to try to figure out offline, take a look at the next, I'm just saying this from my mm -hmm. perspective, take a look at the next three um, Amherst School Committee meetings and what's on the calendar and what needs to be on the calendar. Get feedback from Jonathan and what the designers say around what they think they can do when, in terms of a useful, engaged conversation with us, and then map out how we address those three levels of interest, uh, or at least certainly two levels, of what our current capital plan is, and then what the framework is for building renovations and replacements. And I, I would agree that we shouldn't limit it subject matter-wise to just Fort River and the Feasibility Committee. We should just have a meeting on new facilities, period. And one section of that meeting should be about whatever we're going to talk about around the Feasibility Study Fort River. Other parts of it can be, it could be 10 minutes. Here's what we're, you know, here's what we submitted for Wildwood. Yeah. Anyways, that's my thought. 
So I, I would agree with that, and I think that that's kind of the direction that we've been headed in anyway. And I think that given the fact that um, we just had a recent meeting where we approved uh, Dr. Morris's superintendent goals uh, that include capital planning and that include, you know, it sounds like you've already started doing work on that, which is fantastic, um, that it absolutely makes sense for us to map out, you know, our meetings in accordance with that. Um, and I was going to say that I think the um, just one point that the Fort River School had been identified, you know, in, in the MSBA application as the priority building, only because we had the work done at Wildwood over for the the boiler over the summer. Um, but that in no way means that you know Fort River is more important than Wildwood. It's just we had to prioritize one, and that was a decision that we made, you know, as a committee uh, to do that. And so very well cognizant of the fact that we have multiple buildings that need attention and that we have this feasibility study going on right now. So I think that that makes sense, what's been uh, addressed now, and, you know, to, to, I guess, move us along as I'm looking at the time, too. It's 9.25. Um, and, uh, you know, this is an important topic of conversation, but it sounds like we need to come back, right? Yeah. We need to, you know, to continue having more conversations about that. So. Uh, Mr. Sal, then I guess if we can call on you in the next couple of weeks or so to hear what the designers have recommended, um, that would be great. And then maybe work in concert with you to figure out what those joint meetings would, would look like. And, and uh, Superintendent and Mr. Demling, if you're available, great. And if not, I can maybe perhaps call on you, Mr. Sure. Hagujima, too. Sure. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, not so relevant to Mr. Salvin's point. I just, uh, the only thing I want to note, and I'm thinking of the sensitivity rightfully we had earlier about talking about the schools, that Crocker Farm, while not at the same level of infrastructure needs, is also heavily involved in the capital plan. And, you know, we heard some from the community prior, and um, uh, there's different needs um, at Crocker, but there are some pretty significant ones there as well. So I just don't want to, if anyone's watching this and hearing us only talk about the two schools, certainly those two schools from a core walls infrastructure, there's no doubt that it's in better shape. And... You know, we've had problems with cooling there. We've had problems with HVAC there. We've had problems with um, one part of the roof structure there. So by no means am I suggesting for anyone watching that Quarker Farm won't be – Quarker Farm's needs won't be addressed in the capital plan. They certainly will be. I think the message from the committee was that we wanted to hear about all the schools. Absolutely. I mean, I think the, what was trying to be emphasized by each of us in our own way, yeah. and, uh, and certainly Ms. Spitzer, was that we want to hear about everything. Absolutely, and that's what we'll do. Uh, just because I'm going to be thanking him later for something else, I, I, ca I can't let Mr. Salvin uh, leave without thanking him for his volunteer public service chairing this committee <laughs> that we're obviously all very interested in. And so I wanted to thank you for that. It's a, it's a long uh, dedication of your time, and it's, it's much appreciated. Thank you. You're, wel you're welcome. And I, 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 you know, I really am not speaking really from just myself. It's, as you know, hundreds of hours of volunteer hours from everyone on our, on our probably pretty broad uh, committee and so uh, we thank you thank you okay um, so moving us along uh, the next item on the agenda is a PVCICS expansion letter and this was the draft that Mr. Dumling had so graciously agreed to prepare for the committee to review um, it, this is just a draft, and so it was meant to both emphasize points that we've raised previously um, in other iterations of this uh, of this letter um, for prior votes, but also to bring in some new data points. And so, mm -hmm. Mr. Demling, I don't know if there's anything that you want to sure. say about this draft. Yeah, I'll just read it through five times so that we're all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I'll just give it like a sort of. Hopefully, you've had a chance to read this before. Um, but um, to sort of put this in context, so I took the base structure of the letter, letter that we used last year where the commissioner agreed with us and mm -hmm. did not approve the expansion, so that was good. Um, a, a couple of things that I, that I changed um, for this year. So we have a new commissioner, Jeff Riley. Um, we don't really know exactly what um, will be persuasive to him. That's sort of the core nut to crack here, right? Um, we know he was the receiver in Lawrence. He used charter schools as part of that. Um, intervention, um, but beyond that, we don't really know. Um, so uh, the first page is, is sort of a reminder to him about, okay, the, here's, this uh, proposal has kind of a rich history and a pretty consistent response from the board and the past commissioners. Um, the next page uh, is sort of the core um, enrollment argument um, with the, the underserved um, subgroups of low-income students with disabilities 
English language learners and, and the response that the school has had to that. Um, the, the next page is, is new. It, it, it's mostly one long chart, um, but really puts a very fine point on what I thought was the most stark and uh, sort of irrefutable piece of data from DESI uh, that outlines um, an under-enrollment of, of a particular subgroup, in this case, students with disabilities, um, and just how uh, extreme that outlier was. Um, uh, it, it also adds in a little section here, uh, a few comments from a report from May 2016 of a number of parents from um, charter school presented a survey to their board of trustees about experience um, with their uh, parents with students with special needs. So sort of the quantitative and the qualitative data to consider in, in when he's making an evaluation. Um, and then the last page um, puts a fine point on one of the uh, proposed reasons for the expansion. So in the proposal, it's, it's so that students can attend desegregated, integrated public schools, uh, which is a, a pretty strong claim, <laughs> pretty strong language. And so I juxtapose that with the, with the data that shows um, quite the opposite. Um, there's one little section um, relative to the rest of the letter. It's, it's fairly little about the, the financial impact. Um, this is just because, and the paragraph describes it, the DESE does not have any control over the charter funding formula. And um, it's been our general assumption that so going to the board and <coughs> raging about the inequities in the mm -hmm. funding formula is, is not really going to get you anywhere. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's, it's in there because it is a driver, um, but we sort of acknowledge that. Um, and then just the history and the references um, at the end. So that was the thinking and structuring it in that way. But, you know, that's just, again, it's, I know it's a lot, but it is a draft, so <laughs> however we want to put this together is totally fine. So I'm, I'm just going to jump in. In the, in the uh, interest of time, I think, uh, I think it's a great letter. I think that the charts are really well done. Uh, incredible amount of work here, Mr. Dumbling, so thank you so much for doing that. I really, really appreciate that. They're extremely clear and easy to follow. My only recommendation is actually that we highlight um, the, the chart on page 3. Uh, where PVCICS appears at the bottom, and you highlighted the number, you have it 5.9, but mm -hmm. because it's blue, and mm -hmm. you know, it's so oh, right. maybe putting a yellow box around okay. that draws the eye attention down to the very right. bottom, which is exactly the point that you're trying yeah. to make. Um, so just for anybody who's following this at home, um, so <laughs> <laughs> the cameras, because you can't see the chart. Um, so we're, we're looking at percent of students with disabilities, and the average from all the sending districts to the school is 20%. And that lists out every single sending district. Uh, the second to last sending, uh, the very last sending district is 14.4%, mm -hmm. and then PVCICS is 5.9. Um, and just taking through some of the other statewide reports, it's, it's the lowest percentage of special ed students in any school um, that serves elementary grades in the entire state. Um, lowest of any comparison charter school, uh, lowest of any charter school, a uh, 403rd lowest out of 407 public school districts and charter schools in Massachusetts. So it's, 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 I tried to stay away from exaggerating language, um, but just sort of put the data that, that calls out what an outlier. Yeah. The, the number. So hopefully I did a yeah. And, and the only, aside from just a, a couple of very minor like typos mm -hmm. that I think, you know, can be fixed probably even after this committee, were to, if, it, if it decides to take a vote tonight on this, um, I think this is, this is a great letter. And I also just wanted to state um, that Ms. McDonald asked me to say that she has read over this letter and that she agrees with the draft and, and likes the draft and she's okay with any changes that we make to it. So I just wanted to state that for the record. Yeah, no, I think it's very good, and I, I think I think you did a, um, a, a very good job of something I s support, which is letting the data and the sort of the facts of the argument speak for themselves and lead, and in, in, in keeping away from editorial. I think on the um, the first bullet on the first page, um, I'm not I don't I'm not I don't need to edit it right here. I'm just saying I think. Because you mentioned that Commissioner Riley's new, um, I think I would look at editing that first line. It says, Desi's reasons for rejecting the expansion requests have not changed. Because logically, if they change their reasons, then guess what? The reasons have changed. <laughs> um, so I, what you really I mean, what you mean is obviously the second part of the sentence, which is um, 
the reasons for rejecting expansion requests haven't been rejected or remediated. <laughs> I mean, right. that's really what you're trying to say. Right. And I would just find a way to say it that doesn't imply, I mean, obviously very unintentionally, right. imply that you're you're thinking about what they're thinking right, right. as opposed to what the facts are. <laughs> right, right. Because I think otherwise that's a really strong point to make at the beginning, that, you know, their reasons were not remediated or addressed by PV says yes. Any other uh, yes. comments or? I guess um, is it, sir? my only question is, and I think I think the reason you're focusing on these two charts um, on page, sorry, this one page, on the last page of, with charts, mm -hmm. the percent Hispanic students full history and percent Hispanic students fiscal year 18. Um, it just seems like potentially you might want to include other categories of minority students, and I'm assuming you consider that, but, and you're calling them out because it's the largest minority population in the sending districts, but I don't know. I'm wondering if you see the same trend with the other populations. Yeah, so, um, so, so the reason why these four groups are called out, so Hispanic, English language learners, students with disabilities, low income, so those are the four, four of the five achievement gap subgroups, so four of the subgroups that have a demonstrated statewide achievement gap. Um, the other being African American students. Um, it so happens that their African American numbers did go up last year. They're still below the district average, and so one could could make the argument that um, e even even with the group in which they have the highest enrollment, they're still below the sending district average. It is curiously above the comparison index. So there's a, there's this wonky thing that happens where the comparison index, which is Desi's statistically calculated yada yada is always below the average, about 20% below, um, I, I, I found on, on the various metrics. Um, it's, <laughs> one can make a cynical argument that that's so the charter schools look better. <laughs> um, I, probably, I would not argue against that argument, but um, it makes it, it's a little hard. I, I would, I, I think the reason not to include the other, uh, not to include that is just, is just that um, it, it's, not as, it's not as extreme of, a, of, a, of, a, of an under, underserving in this subgroup. I guess my only concern is that I could understand if there's a correlation between being Hispanic and an English language learner, and then the Chinese immersion school may not be my choice if I'm already potentially bilingual. Right. So if the advantage, I, I'm just thinking like in, in terms of strengthening our argument and making it as strong as possible, um, it may be useful to include other populations that wouldn't have that potential explanatory factor for having a lower number of kids choosing to attend an English, you know, a non-English, sorry, a bilingual education program. Right, 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 <laughs> I'm having right, trouble right. But, um, cause, because that's the thing with English language learners with Hispanic students, potentially, it, it may be less attractive of a program just because of the, right. the potential bilingual nature of the students or who, who would be in that population. Right. So just to ask the question out loud, I think um, because the deadline has shifted to December 3rd now, right, for, for this, um, and because there could potentially be a, a larger edit, which is, is totally okay, but I'm just wondering if, yeah. if, it's, uh, if, if the committee would be okay with Mr. Denling adding, perhaps making a couple of these edits and adding that information, um, is that, would you, do you need to see it again? If so, then I guess we'd have to try to get the final draft on the 27th. So we need a vote on the letter. Okay. I, I will. I would approve this letter as it stands today. I'd be happy to move forward with it because um, I probably won't be available for the next meeting. Um, but I mean, all of you guys can vote also in my absence. So, if, I, I don't know if other people share my. my well, I, I mean, I, I think that having, uh, I think having some reference to other um, minority categories is a good thing to do just because silence on the subject could sometimes be viewed as suspicious. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but I mean, I wouldn't put another chart in. I'd just literally throw a sentence in describing the other patterns underneath it. Yeah. I think by, below, I think, yeah, below, but we in that section, in that section in the back. So I think by doing that by reference, um, you're, you're essentially being transparent and covering yourself around mm -hmm. what the data says mm -hmm. um, and acknowledging that, you know, I think we're so, we're so strong on this that you don't want to look like you're cherry-picking your arguments. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, so anyways, there's that. And then other than my, my edit on the first, the first little bullet, um, I'm otherwise happy to vote to approve it, assuming that there's some sort of edit on the front that worked out that I don't really care what. I mean, I, you know what I mean. I care what it is, but I don't care what it is. <laughs> you'll, you'll do a great job. <laughs> Any thoughts on, on that, Mr. Dumbling? I mean, is this something that you, do you think you have enough information from the committee to make those those minor edits, and are you confident that? You yeah, can... I think so. And okay. I mean, I, I can also like I can run it by the chair, mm -hmm. so that you know, <coughs> you could just you know, you could just uh, reality check me that I haven't said anything that's like egregiously out of line with what our conversation just was. Dr. Morris, does that make sense to you as yeah. well? I okay. think so, yeah. Mr. Nakajima. I'd like to move to approve okay. the PVCICS uh, letter in opposition to the expansion um, uh, with edits as recommended by the committee. I second. I second that motion. Okay. Uh, so just a, a quick note, uh, Ms. McDonald is no longer on the phone, and so we're not doing roll call votes uh, any further. Um, so all those in favor? So in favor, raising your hand. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you very much, Mr. Dunham, right. again for working on this, and I'm more than happy to work with you okay. on it uh, as cool. needed. And uh, we'll get it out the door as soon as we can. Great. Budget guidance. Budget guidance. That walk out the door. Uh, well, there's a little exchange, and, and because this is typically happens in the November meeting, this in some ways is a special meeting that wasn't originally scheduled. Uh, we could have that conversation to um, basically the budget guidance conversation would be identifying areas that you want more details on in the December meeting. Um, Mr. Mangano is comfortable receiving that information in late November as opposed to today and still coming back in December. I can take the notes and we can do it tonight, but it may be our agenda for the 27th doesn't look as robust and maybe doing it not at 940 in the evening. That would be my, pre my preference. Yeah, um, so. I'm just looking to the committee to see if anybody has any burning desire to talk about the budget right now. I mean, I'm not going to. Yeah. So I probably will not be at the meeting on the 27th. Is there a way I can, having not been at one of these meetings, um, it would be helpful to either communicate directly with Sean about what type of guidance he's looking for, and then I could maybe communicate with him by email before I'm taking a maternity leave. Yeah, absolutely, and we could connect via phone because I could give you maybe an orientation to the way we've done fun. that, and, and you certainly can connect with Mr. Mangano. I'm not sure you're going to need to because it's, it's much more at the what are areas of the budget that you're looking for more information about, and then mm -hmm. in the December meeting, we bring the district brings that back in, in great detail. So um, it's not looking fine-tooth comb. It's actually like what are programmatic <laughs> areas that you're looking for for us to provide information to you and the public about. But we could play that out over phone yeah. sometime okay, so soon because I want to yeah. be conscious of it. So my, the 16th is the working uh, deadline <laughs> on, on the baby. Um, <laughs> the deadline. Yeah, but you never know. So um, yeah, let's schedule something maybe for next, although with the holiday. So I'll we can follow up offline. Yeah. Yeah. Follow. yeah. Okay. okay, so uh, with the committee's permission, we will move this item then for the November 27th meeting. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is the Regional School Planning Board update, and that is Mr. Dumling, I believe. Yes. So, um, let's see. So, we met recently. We're meeting again. So, our, our, new, our new meeting every day, our new meeting schedule is every other Friday, 1030 to 12. Mm -hmm. So, we met last Friday. We'll be meeting again another week and a half. Um, we're meeting with the Pelham Select Board on Wednesday and the Pelham PTO on Thursday, continuing our outreach, that seems to be the word of the day, outreach um, uh, tour. Um, we uh, had a, a meeting with a potential uh, forms facilitator that we really liked, um, so talking with him about uh, budget and such and what he might be able to do for us, but I th I'd say right now that's looking pretty good for him to be able to help us plan slash run slash report on two to four public forums in the January plus time frame. Um, we are moving forward with our financial and our process consultants. So um, we, we had a good discussion with our financial consultant two meetings ago and with Mr. Mangano last meeting about uh, assessment methods. That We got all wonky with statutory and alternative and um, so, because part of uh, the deliverable of our committee to our financial consultant is that we need to pick uh, uh, two or three options for him to cost out so we can 
put that in as part of his financial analysis. Um, so that that's one near-term deliverable. Um, so I don't have an actual date on the deliverable of that from our financial consultant, but that is something that as soon as we get that, I would want to bring back here. And um, I remember initially Mr. Nakajima was like, you know, once you have something that has some meat on the bone, you know, it'd be good to like react to. So that's, this would be a bone that we'll have some meat on it. Great. Um, <laughs> another thing that will be, uh, I think, will be good uh, food for thought, foodful discussion is we're looking at um, the different possibilities of a, what the composition of the school committee can be and, and how you elect the school committee. Uh, whether it's district wide, whether it's uh, town versus town to town, uh, weighting of different votes, um, we've, we've really gotten into the, the details on that and um, sort of saying, okay, given the enrollment numbers with Amherst and Pelham, what would that actually look like? And then what would mm -hmm. we, what of the of the five options would we dismiss out of hand and why? And then what are the three options left, you know, that we have, and what are the pros and cons that we've seen so far? Mm -hmm. I think having that would be a nice sort of detail thing to mm -hmm. sink your teeth into. So look forward to. Presenting that, um, and one other thing, and so this is the Jonathan Salvin connection. Um, so um, one of the things that we've wanted to do for a while, and that we've wanted to do in the proper scoped way, is this question of can Pelham be expand, Pelham School be expanded? Um, so there's a number of financial um, incentives for, to, to Amherst for regionalizing. Um, one of them is this idea of well, if the building is actually in really good shape or relatively good shape compared to Amherst buildings. Um, and the uh, number of school choice students attrited over time, uh, could Amherst students fill that void? Could that offload some of our enrollment need? And could it even be expanded if it was possible to do that? And we've been really conscious as a, as a board that, um, that we're, we are not in the business of doing feasibility studies <laughs> or costing out options. Um, however, it, it, it continues to sort of be asked on the periphery. And so we want to be able to provide more than just a, OK, we've heard the question, we don't know. Um, so we reached out to Coon Riddle Architects, and Mr. Salvin agreed to pro bono walk through the building with us and just talk to us about it. Um, so I wasn't there at the walkthrough, but uh, that was reported back to us at our last meeting. And Mr. Salvin's going to type up a little summary. But basically, the, the core general question we want to answer is, is it prohibitive to even be, even be thinking about expansion? Is that, is that crazy, given the state of the building and the, uh, and the lay of the land? And essentially, his conclusion was was no. It's not. It's not prohibitive. It's the the building's in, in fairly decent shape. The the roof is not in great shape. So if you wanted to expand, you would probably uh, add another an, add an adjacent structure hmm. of either one or two stories because the the land is fairly flat and buildable hmm. there. You know, obviously that opens up a whole discussion about what you do about parking and fields and whatnot. But we're not going there. We're not a building committee, right? And so. Um, and we're not going to get into cost options either. So we, we really just wanted to be able to answer the sort of, maybe not even 201 level question, the 102 level question of, you know, have you explored at all this idea of expanding Pelham? And, and so we did. And um, Mr. Salvin's going to write up a little summary. And we'll obviously share that with, with you all. Okay. So that sort of puts to bed that exploration of that little chunk that's been on the to-do list for a while. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you, Mr. Dunley, sure. for all your work on that. Um, Okay, so uh, last item on the agenda is gifts. Debbie, do we have any gifts? No, no gifts this time. No gifts this time. Can okay. I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, did Ms. McDonald go off the, uh, did she leave the meeting after the At break? our break. At okay, our break. I just need to note it. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, school committee planning. I think we have quite a few items that we be looking at for the agenda for next week. Do you want to go over the Sure. So the ones I had, uh, one is budget guidance, capital planning, whether it's formal or not, with, our, with the designers, some school building, school feasibility um, committee update, uh, regionalization update. Um, we said we'd come back to the UMass study follow-up mm -hmm. um, about potential actions the school committee or myself would take. Um, Two other topics that may or may not go on the 27th, but I have one is um, Alice, which is the we've done at the regional level. We haven't yeah. brought to the elementary, but now that we're involved in training elementary staff, we thought we'd want to do that. Whether that could be November, December, I think that's arbitrary for our point of view. And this question of the location of meetings, um, mm -hmm. I think, is worthy of actually having as an agenda item because I think it's of high interest. Um, and we received a request from Amherst Media that I think we should all talk about. Great. 
And I just want to add the facilities uh, update here again, because I know this, t this time it was more informal, mm -hmm. but we definitely want to keep that on the agenda. Yeah, sure. That's what the committee has expressed before. Anything else that we left off? Okay. Uh, well, so I will take a motion. So move to adjourn. Do we have a second? It's a second. <laughs> all right. All those in favor? Excellent. Meeting adjourned at 9.49 p.m. That's we're laid back there with the second.